you know, live on YouTube, so please can go ahead. Sounds good. Okay, can you hear me? I can actually start slowly because I have a lot of things to introduce and go to. Um, Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Um, good morning, good good afternoon, good evening, and in the case of Aparna, good night, but I hope you don't go away right now. Uh, my name is Shripti Mutlidhar. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Picard Institute for Learning and Memory at MIT. I'm a co-founder of Biosearch India, and I will be the MC for today's event. Um, our volunteers today are Annapurna PK from CSIR CCMB and Sachmi Mustafa, who's an alumnus of um, ICER Pune. And both of them will be helping us with anything that you need um, and anything that we need. So technical requirements for us and help you with like the chat, or, or you can also ask them for help. Um, Zoom is the platform we're using today, as you can see, and hopefully we all have a productive uh, session and, and interact with our speakers and feel free to drop in any of the things that you need on the chat box. So as you would have seen in our event posters for the day, we're going to have public talks by six speakers, followed by a closing address that I'll be giving. Um, and we'll be ending with the breakout rooms from around 4 to 4.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Uh, as, as yesterday, we've decided to open the breakout rooms today to any conference attendee uh, who's interested in interacting more with our speakers, um, regardless of whether or not they signed up previously. Uh, we'll also be posting the Zoom link for the breakout rooms uh, in the conference chat closer to the end of the speaker talks today. So if you're interested in networking, community building, extended discussion, you have that one burning question you need to ask the speaker, please take advantage of this. Um, and I'm also equally happy and sad that this is the last day of Neurofarm India 2021, but the show must go on. And I'm hoping we have a, a wonderful day. So we have, as always, two general notices for our audience. Uh, we would like to remind you that that all um, that we are live streaming this on YouTube, uh, on Biosearch India's YouTube channel. So for any members of the public and in Indian academia who have not received invites to the Zoom webinar, uh, please head to the Biosearch India YouTube channel to catch this live. Um, in, please pass on the link to your friends if you need. Uh, we will also be monitoring the YouTube chat stream um, in addition to our Zoom chat stream. So, you know, uh, feel free to drop questions wherever is comfortable. The archive live streams to the previous uh, day sessions are also available on the same channel. Um, you, you can also click through. There should be a link coming up soon in the chat box. Um, we will not be accepting any audience questions to the field overview talk, which will be given today by Nandini Chatterjee Singh. Uh, but for all other talks and sessions, we highly encourage you to be chatty, to be interactive um, in the chat box. Uh, and ask all your questions in the Q&A box, because it just makes it easier for us to, to sort of read through the comments and, and take the questions for our speakers. Uh, please upvote the questions that you want the speakers and the panelists to answer. Um, and please address uh, your questions to specific panelists so we know who it is for. Um, and so, yeah, our volunteers and MCs can find them easily if you just put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. So thank you for that. Um, so let's start off the talk for today. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Aparna Bhadri, who is so kind, and she's joining us from the West Coast of the United States, where it's very late. Uh, she's an assistant professor at UCLA, and the Bhadri Lab works on understanding how intrinsic, spatiotemporal, and intercellular signal drives progenitors of the cortex and the human brain uh, to generate the observed diversity and their activation during glioblastoma. Uh, and, she, and they use um, integrative single-cell omic approaches uh, in primary patient tumor resections and in vivo cultures of tumors. Uh, she was also a recipient of the 2019 K99 ROO Pathway to Independence Award and the 2019 uh, L'Oreal for Women in Science Award. Uh, she also serves as a member with the Allen Institute's Next Generation Leaders Advisory Council. Uh, so yes, like I said earlier, Dr. Rapuna is joining us from the West Coast, and she's very kind of agreed to give this talk um, where it's 12.30 a.m. local time. Uh, and so we're adjusting our schedule a little bit today uh, so she can present before Dr. Nandini Chatterjee Singh, who will give the field overview after this. So Dr. Aparna, take it away and thanks again. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. I really 
appreciate the opportunity to be here today and I am excited about um, interacting with some of you. It is a little late here, so I'll probably leave after this, but I will put my contact info at the end. So if anyone, you know, I'll take questions, but then after that, if anyone has anything that they want to discuss, please do reach out. I would be excited to hear from any audience members. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the developing human brain in normal development, as well as in glioblastoma. And what you're seeing here is a example of the developing human brain at gestational week six. So a very early time point of development. And this was a beautiful tile scan taken by a graduate student that I worked with, Ugama. And so um, I thought it was a nice image to start the talk with. Just as a quick introduction about me, for those of you who um, might not know anything about my background, I have lived in the United States my whole life. I was born in the US and grew up in Wisconsin, which is in the middle of the country. Um, after that, I did my undergraduate work at Rice University, where I studied both biochemistry and cell biology, as well as political science. Um, and I was on the debate team there. So that was a really fun experience. I went straight to my PhD at Stanford, where I studied epidermal differentiation and epithelial cancers in the cancer biology program. And after studying the skin, I decided that I was actually much more pulled towards studying the brain, which is why I chose to do a postdoc at UCSF um, in San Francisco in the lab of Dr. Arnold Kriegstein. And as of January, I just opened up my own lab at UCLA um, and excited to start building the group in the science. So this audience will need no introduction to the adult human brain, but as you know, it's an incredibly complex structure. And my work has focused primarily on the outermost layer of the developing of, of the brain, of the adult um, brain called the cortex. And the cortex enables a lot of different functional connectivity and inputs and sensory integration. And across each of the different areas of the cortex, which enable visual function or judgment or other types of motor function, there are six layers. And the six layers of neurons are each unique in their connectivity pattern, as well as, as you can see, their density across cortical areas. And recent work has started to show that there is actually also transcriptomic or RNA-based differences across these different regions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that when studying the human brain, if we're interested in understanding how these populations emerge or how the stem cells give rise to them, we need to study development because the vast majority of those cell populations are gone by the time an individual is born. And this is important for understanding our developmental disorders, psychiatric disorders, responses to injury and treatment for neurodegenerative diseases, as well as many of the trajectories that are crucial in the etiology of cancers, such as glioblastoma, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of this talk. Another thing that I like to show and highlight is this cross-section of human brain versus other mammals. And as you can see, the human brain is quite large compared to most of the other mammals. And this, la this outermost section of the cortex, which is nissel stained, um, this is the cortex, is gyrified and is three times larger than the chimpanzee, which is the human's closest relative. It's also very different from the mouse. And you know, model systems are incredibly valuable and have increased our understanding in the field. But there are certain questions that are important to start to use with human, especially as we have access to human patient samples and models. And so this is something that I'm very excited about and I'm hoping to pursue throughout my own lab. For those of you who maybe study the actual neuroscience rather than de the development, I'll give you a brief overview of cortical development. Cortical development begins with a uniform neuroepithelial sheet and then gives rise to radial glia cells. These radial glia cells mature into different subtypes, including outer radial glia, ventricular radial glia, and truncated radial glia, and primarily give rise to neurons through intermediate progenitor cells. These cells serve as transit amplifying populations, which birth newborn neurons, which are able to migrate up the scaffolding of the radial glia and differentiate into either deep layer neurons or upper layer neurons. Once neurogenesis is largely complete, the radial glia switch to gliogenesis and give rise to the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and other glial some of the other glial populations of the cortex. So as a quick overview of my research interests, I'm primarily interested in characterizing this neural stem cell and understanding how it's able to give rise to the vast diversity of what exists in the human brain. 
how some of this can be modeled with cortical organoids to better understand the normal developmental processes, different fate specification cues, as well as how we can study neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. And then also how the stem cell is dysregulated in the context of glioblastoma. I will focus on normal development in glioblastoma today. Most of my work up until this point has occurred using gene expression as an output because we have the throughput to be able to look at a lot of cells, but I'm also interested in incorporating other metrics, including epigenetics, metabolomics, and lipidomics in the future. So I'll start with a brief overview of some unpublished data that I have, and this is work that was towards the end of my postdoc, so it took place in Arnold Kriegstein's lab with a number of wonderful collaborators that I'll acknowledge at the end. Um, so one of the big questions in the field of um, cortical development is how do you get these very distinct cortical areas that we were looking at in those first few slides? We know that there is a initial morphogen gradient that establishes some of the initial patterning. And open questions exist as to whether these morphogens drive intrinsic cues within the radial glia or whether the onset of sensory input through the lamocortical fibers or other um, extrinsic mechanisms result in further specification. And a variety of elegant experiments primarily conducted in the mouse have really highlighted that it's likely an interplay between the two. But we thought that if we can use primary developing human cortex samples, we might be able to better dig into this question. So one of the first data sets that we used to start looking at this was actually a couple of years ago. This was in collaboration with Tom Nowakowski, who now has a lab at UCSF. And we sampled 48 individuals and where possible took matched prefrontal cortex and visual cortex. And from this, we were able to capture 4,000 cells, which was great for the time. And we were able to use principal component analysis and clustering to identify subtypes. And this highlighted most of the subtypes that we would expect to exist. For these plots, which you will see a lot of during this talk, these are either TISNES or UMAPs. They're basically two-dimensional representations of single cell data. And each dot is an individual cell and shows its proximity to other cells based on this dimensionality reduction. From this initial data set, we observed that initial dissections of prefrontal cortex and visual cortex were segregating the cell populations in only the maturing neurons. And this led us to an initial model where we thought that there were a small number of differences in the prefrontal cortex and visual cortex that cascade into larger differences as the cells differentiate. So we wanted to explore this further by sampling more brain regions as well as more cortical regions across more time points of development. And so we were able to do this from gestational week five up until actually early postnatal periods, but I'll focus on the second trimester for this talk. And this work was then done using 10X genomics um, capture and we were able to um, isolate about a million cells from the brain and 400,000 cells from the cortex. If we look at the distribution of these cells across the different individuals and regions, we can see that primarily there's pretty good intermixing and I can go into some of the technical details if anyone's interested in how we overcame some of the batch effects. We also identified most of the major populations we were expecting to see, including neurons, the intermediate progenitor cells, radial glia, dividing populations, other glial populations, interneurons, and then microglia and vascular cells. And in each of these plots, the gene that was used to define this cluster, among others, is shown in this inset here. And you can see the areas represented throughout the rest of the UMAP. Our major question with this data was how is regional connectivity across these cell types defined? Is it largely defined by area? or by cell type. And so we use these constellation of um, plot approaches to look at connectivity between cell types across regions. And what we saw was that primarily there was specification by cell type, but there were specific regions where cells are strongly drawn together, such as in the ganglionic eminences. And when we look at more differential expression, we also see that there are some pervasive signatures that define regions. And so we were able to conclude that cell type is a defining feature, but that at these stages, region is very identifiable, which is not terribly surprising, but we wanted to be able to contrast that with what we're seeing in the neocortex. So similarly, we subset it out 
cells from the cortex and looked for the major populations that we were expecting. And again, we saw those same populations and we were able to cluster these into 138 individual clusters, which we think may map to certain cell types or certain developmental states. What we saw from this hierarchical clustering is that there were some clusters that were strongly enriched for one area, but unlike across the whole brain, there were a lot of mixing between different cortical areas, suggesting that we haven't quite cleanly separated out those areas quite as firmly as we have for the brain structures. We looked at this across the differentiation cascade. And again, we have a constellation plot here with each of the clusters marked by the number and the cell type marked by the color. And there were a couple take home points from this. The primary one was that intermediate progenitor cells, which are a progenitor type and have always thought to be closer to radial glia than to neurons, actually map pretty closely to neurons, less so to radial glia, which we can see in this quantification. And the other take home message is that the cell identity signatures included upregulation or downregulation of radial glia suggesting, as we know, that the neuronal signature is not very highly um, upregulated, potentially because of insufficient maturation at the stages that we're sampling. So we thought that this was interesting because the radial glia gene signature really seems to be driving progenitor versus neuronal identity. We wanted to ensure that some of the transcription factors that we were looking at were modeling the expression patterns that we expected. And indeed they were with NR2F1, also known as CUPTF, more occipital and LMO3, more rostral. So we started looking at the different areas based on these same cell types. So again, another constellation plot, I think this is the last one. And what we were able to see is that there is a tight cohesiveness of the radial glia, similar to our previous model, but that the cascading is happening starting in the intermediate progenitor cells and expanding out into the neurons. We also see that as early in the radial glia, there is a mutual exclusivity between prefrontal cortex and B1, suggesting that although the intermediate regions are specified at later time points, the initial rostrocaudal axis is being established at very early time points and may be intrinsic to these radial glia. We also saw that there were a decent number of genes that were differentially expressed in radial glia, but that they were much less specific compared to intermediate progenitors or neurons. And one of the things that was very surprising to us was how dynamic these signatures are. I'm showing a representative plot here, but we see this across developmental stages as well, where the gene signatures are really changing in their identity across different cell types and across different stages. And this is a really dynamic process, suggesting that we are very far from really specifying those clean transcriptional types that we expect to see in the adult. This is very exciting to us, and we wanted to be able to see if there are any transcriptional regulators that may be driving this. And again, we see that in radial glia and excitatory neurons, and here PFC and V1 are shown just for clarity, there's some overlap of these transcription factors, but there's many differences. And we think that this may be some sort of a domino effect where you initially have transcription factor expression that then gets the ball rolling and is able to take things forward based on then also what extrinsic factors may be coming in, highlighting that there really is an interplay between those intrinsic and extrinsic factors and a lot of dynamicism. So we were able to spatially validate this, and I won't go through all of the details for the sake of time, but basically we were able to look at 31 genes using a small molecule fish uh, approach to see if some of the patterns we expected were going to be validated across tissue sections in a gestational week 20 sample. And indeed we did see that there was enrichment um, either frontally for these genes or occipitally for these genes. What was actually more surprising to us was how much dynamics was happening across the laminar sheet and how many genes were moving up and down across different cortical areas. We don't quite understand what this means, but we think it's an important thing to think about when trying to model aspects of normal development. We also were able to create networks from this data. And again, saw a lot of diversity and dynamics, <coughs> excuse me, across the cortical span, 
suggesting that things are changing in their co-expression patterns. And although we don't fully understand what this means, it's likely important to characterizing cell types across um, differentiation. So with this, we basically see that there's, you know, from the single cell data, we can start to get a handle on some of the transcriptional relationships between differentiation, maturation, and spatial position. There's some open questions about how can we leverage these data sets to really model and understand what's happening. And this is an interest of the lab is how to better model some of these processes in the cortical organoid to answer questions about key phase specification. I'll very briefly go through this because it is published. So I would like to have some time for questions, but just as an interest in the lab, we are interested in characterizing glioblastoma. So as you may know, glioblastoma is the most aggressive and most common form of adult brain cancer. And the reason it's so deadly is that it has a basic universal recurrence rate. I'm not the first person to be interested in the molecular characterization of GBM. And one of the very first cancer genome atlas projects sought to use bulk RNA sequencing to identify subtypes. But unfortunately, these did, not, um, these did not correlate to therapeutic outcomes. And the very first single study, cell study of glioblastoma showed that there was actually a mix of these different subtypes, even within the same tumor. And more recently, work from Mario Suvo's group has shown that there is also a possibility of moving between different states in the tumor, making it very elusive to target. So we wanted to build on this and again, did single cell RNA sequencing of glioblastoma tumors and compared them to our atlases of both development and adult cell types. So we identified a huge diversity of cell types, including ones that we would exist, like immune, expect like immune populations and OPCs, as well as some very bizarre populations. We wanted to use this data to see if we could identify potential cancer stem cells. And again, we saw that the cell types associated with these uh, STEM-like programs were highly heterogeneous. But one of the interests in the lab has always been radial glia, and we saw that radial glia were being represented in a number of these tumors. So we wanted to know if they looked more like outer radial glia, and indeed we were able to see a preservation of the outer radial glia network, including genes such as PTPRC1, which have been shown to be um, enriched markers for this outer radial glia cell type. Now, one thing that's exciting about this is that these cells undergo a mitotic stomal translocation or jump and divide behavior. And it says that the video is playing, but it won't show it to you. But indeed, we're seeing a jump and divide between the, in, in these cell populations. So we wanted to see what cell types these outer radial glia-like cells are giving rise to. And so we purified them from patient tumors and transplanted them into a cortical organoid in order to trace what progeny they were giving rise to. And as you can see, the cells will invade the organoid and we were able to enrich, but not totally perfectly enrich for this population. However, we saw two things that we were excited about. The positive sort was able to give a rise to a lot of different populations, but so was the negative sort suggesting that this population is propagating cells within the tumor, but also is probably not the only cell type doing so. One thing that's interesting about this is PTPRZ1 has previously been shown to be required for glioblastoma invasion through the ROROC pathway, which has been characterized to be required for that jumping behavior. So we wondered, is PTPRZ1 driving migration through mitotic somal translocation? To answer this question, we knocked down PTPRZ1 for both a normal development slice culture and in a model of glioblastoma. And in both cases, it was able to reduce the jump distance, suggesting that this may be driving some of the invasion. We additionally tested this using an in vitro invasion assay and using a positive control rock inhibitor and saw similar evidence. So it's a very short vignette on glioblastoma, but really the conclusion is that there's a ton of heterogeneity within this tumor. And it's something that we really, we think is important to pursue in order to better treat this cancer. And so moving forward, I already went through some of the directions of my lab. So I'll acknowledge many of the people who are involved in this work as well as my funding and the people in my lab currently. 
And with that, I'm very happy to take questions and I will leave this slide up just for a second so that if people are interested, they can take down the email address. Thank you, Aparna. That was fascinating. I mean, there's, uh, I, knew, I knew there were a lot, there were a lot of G, genetic heterogeneity in there. I just didn't expect it to be so much. Um, I, I don't think we have any questions up yet, but I definitely have one for you. So if I may, um, so I, uh, I'll just preface this question by saying I study interneurons and I'm, I'm interested sort of in, in how they develop. Um, so my question comes from sort of that side. Um, and, and I know you started to look at sort of the, the ganglionic eminences, where, you know, during the development and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so when interneurons move, uh, when they migrate during development, they do sort of go on glia. So they sort of ride on glia to get to the cortex. And, and of course, there are radial glia already there um, in the cortex. So have you seen any differences between those two populations? I mean, they are different, anatomically different, uh, because they're literally perpendicular to each other, like the two tracks. But in terms of, uh, in terms of single cell analysis, what, have you seen anything interesting between them? So, you know, they do have very distinctive transcriptomic profile, and we haven't interrogated this further, but there's some cool tools that are coming out to look at cell-cell communication. And um, those tools do give us an opportunity to see potential crosstalk between the cell populations. So it's possible that they're interacting in ways where not only are the interneurons just migrating against across these, um, you know, these locations of the glia and the radial glia, but also that they're influencing one another's development. And so I think that that's an interesting area of study. It's not something that I've dived into quite yet. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, uh, I feel it's harder because it's sort of at that intersection of anatomy and like single cell omics. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy to resolve very well because, you know, an anatomy can show something very different. Um, mm -hmm. We have one question from Annapurna who asked, are glioblastomas more invasive than neuroblastomas and why so? Um, I don't know if there's like, if there's an answer as to which cancer is the most invasive. Um, glioblastomas are particularly uh, invasive in the sense that they universally recur and they frequently do so at pretty far metastatic regions. I don't know quite as much about neuroblastoma, so I won't comment on the similarities or differences there. Okay, um, I think we have time for some quick questions. Uh, Shreyas Gadge asked, uh, well, he says it was a very fascinating talk, but he also asked, is there a link to uh, glutamate excited toxicity in the setting of glioblastoma? So um, there's definitely a lot of work that's starting to come into play. And I haven't looked at this yet, but I'm hoping that we can use some of the models in the lab to start to understand how some of the neuronal neurotransmitter signaling is actually driving uh, glioblastoma stem cell growth within the tumor. And so this is an area that's really been spearheaded by Michelle Monji, um, but there's a lot of interesting work there. I don't know if anything has been done in terms of excitotoxicity, but I haven't, I haven't looked at it, but potentially that could be an interesting um, therapeutic avenue as well. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I can see it connecting very well with epilepsy or sort of focal epilepsy then, you know, how that influences glioblastoma or whether glioblastomas end up causing focal epilepsy. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Ankush Chakrabarti, I think this is the last one we have. So Ankush Chakrabarti says, amazing talk. Uh, could you comment on epigenetic changes in the brain that could make the brain more prone to glioblastomas? And if yes, what could cause them? Yeah, this is a really interesting chicken and egg problem because fortunately or unfortunately, we don't go around sampling normal brains that are um, not having cancer. So we don't know if there's a predisposition that drives that cancer emergence or if it's a result of some of the mutations. Now, a lot of models of glioblastoma as well as tumors that people have looked at do have rampant epigenetic remodeling. And it's thought to be more of a effect of some of the oncogenic drivers, but there's probably some context there which enables that um, glioblastoma to grow. And this is an area that I think is pretty murky. And so I'm really excited to work on some of this using some of the new omics tools that exist to try and 
better understand where do these glioblastomas come from and are there natural vul vulnerabilities to um, promote their onset in certain people versus others? No, for sure. Uh, yeah, epigenetics is sort of the buzzword right now, and I'm, it's as hard to do in neurons as any other population. So yeah, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, hopefully you hang around just for a little bit before you head to bed, but if not, we totally understand. And thanks again for coming. And thank you for having me. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. All right. Um, and now... Let's extend a warm welcome to Dr. Nandini Chatterjee Singh, who is who will be giving a field overview talk. Um, I'm going to just let let her get set up a little bit while I introduce her, if that's all right. Um, she's going to give a field overview talk on cognitive neuroscience. Uh, she's a professor of cognitive neuroscience at NDRC, and she's currently on special appointment to the UNESCO NGIEP, which is the Mah Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. Um, she, her lab is called the Language Literacy and Music Lab, and, her, uh, and they work on basically investigating speech in individuals with autism and language networks in patients with primary brain tumors uh, and white matter structure for encoding languages in bi or multilingual. And they also assess uh, emotional perception in music along with studying speech and music processing in individuals with autism. Uh, they use a variety of techniques uh, like diffusion tensor imaging, which is VDI, uh, acoustic analysis, and functional and structural neuroimaging. And Dr. Singh is also a 2018 Reliance uh, NASI Platinum Jubilee Prize awardee for application-oriented innovations covering physical and biological sciences, and a 2017 Millennium Alliance Innovation Awardee for developing a tool called DALI, and this is a fascinating tool. It's, a, it's, it's, it's DALI is short form for Dyslexia Assessment for Languages of India, and it's used to screen for dyslexia in Indian languages. And this has, of course, never existed before, so Dr. Nandini is definitely a pioneer. Um, and she's representing, like I said, the subfield of cognitive neuroscience. And take it away, Dr. Nandini. You still see can you hear me? Yes, can finally. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, I must say kudos to you for uh, being up, uh, what, four nights in a row. And this is the fifth one. And many of uh, the other colleagues just shows uh, a massive commitment to the cause, I think. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be able to uh, share a few ideas. And um, and it, it actually turned out to be a very interesting journey putting this uh, presentation together. Um, it's been quite exciting. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can try and share some of that excitement and promise um, that I found as I put this together. So um, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, because cognitive neuroscience is a relatively new field. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, I can try and um, convince you what are the kinds of people that I, I looked at whilst I was putting this presentation together. And um, so whilst cognition is, uh, is broadly the mental process of uh, acquiring knowledge and understanding uh, thought experience that we uh, develop through our senses and through our experiences, Cognitive neuroscience is uh, a relatively new field which developed in the 80s and is really trying to um, get, as I try, like to often say, the biological basis for behavior. Okay. And uh, that, that, that whole notion that um, uh, for psychologists that the brain can now try and explain some behavior took a lot of um, uh, challenges and a lot of convincing to do. And, uh, the advancement of a lot of um, machine techniques and industry techniques in the form of um, uh, neuroimaging, the EEG, have played a very big role in transforming this field. And of course, uh, the invaluable data that has come from patients, you know, I, I mean, there are unfortunate consequences to, um, uh, to, to stroke or degeneration, but there's also a lot of learning that happens about how the brain works. And and if we can manage to put this together, science also ends up advancing in the process. So cognitive science as a field has uh, existed for longer and uh, developed more in the 1950s. Okay? And that has actually had uh, people from different disciplines, philosophers, linguists, uh, psychologists, neuroscientists, mathematicians, 
all of them come together where they've been trying to understand the mind and its processes, okay? And, and then try and make the transition to how this translates to um, the brain and um, uh, the different processes that, uh, or the different blocks that must be, uh, that might be happening underlying bigger, larger processes. So how do small components kind of get assembled to give rise to larger processes? And, and so this has largely been, of course, uh, uh, an understanding of human behavior. Okay. Uh, and then as uh, the field developed with the understanding of the brain, its organization, and like I mentioned, um, uh, the fact that there were very interesting populations that people encountered after the war or after brain injury, uh, which told them a lot more about how cognition actually happens in humans. And that gave rise to the, uh, the whole area of cognitive neuroscience. So it's almost like, uh, how does uh, uh, the brain operationalize the mind? You know, and, and that's a tall order and we continue to try and understand that. But suffice it to say that, um, psychology and neurosciences have come together to give rise to cognitive neuroscience, but also now cognitive neurology and uh, psychiatry uh, have provided extremely interesting and fascinating uh, insights into the understanding of uh, the human brain and consequently the human mind. And, uh, and so uh, for, the, for the purposes of um, uh, the next few minutes, I've, uh, I've tried to be a little more inclusive and try to talk, bring into four uh, people who are working in cognitive neurosciences, certainly uh, women in India, but also those who might be in the cognitive sciences. Because uh, it's very heartening to know that the field uh, started out small, but is now uh, broadened and expanded quite a bit. And that's very, very exciting. And I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Shruti and Vaishnavi for, uh, for asking me to do this uh, and put this together. So the kinds of questions that uh, uh, cognitive neuroscientists tend to address are, uh, you know, how do individual neurons finally go on to, uh, to form um, not only complex architectures, but explain more complex human behavior. Okay. And, and so there is an interest in looking at, um, at you know, all things human, as they say. So how is language processed? How does lead, reading develop? And uh, how do we un understand music? And if there is music from different cultures, uh, are there universal components that play into the understanding of processing of this music? In fact, music over the years has emerged as an extremely interesting and rich stimulus to, to study the brain. It allows you to study not just auditory processing, but even how uh, auditory processing uh, training as well as emotion all come together to create a completely fascinating experiences uh, for all of us. And, and uh, uh, more um, mundane issues, which we often take for granted like attention. Okay? Uh, so crucial for almost everything we do in life and yet very little of how we understand how attention is now processed in the brain. And more recently, uh, ideas of, um, of compassion, of, uh, of mindfulness, uh, empathy, which are all such uh, unique traits, which for many years we believed were uniquely human, but now we are uh, gradually realizing actually exist along evolution too. You know? Altruism is something that is seen in, um, in rats as well as in monkeys. So it's been fascinating on how uh, we are beginning to understand these, uh, uh, these big concepts and uh, uh, the, the experiments underlying them, some of them have been extremely elegant, purely at the level of behavior. And some have combined um, them with neuroimaging um, of, of the highest quality now. You, know, you have uh, beautiful ways to try and understand how white matter connectivity can contribute to uh, building specific training and circuitry in the brain. And it happens at as, you know, I mean, it can happen over hours that you can, you're able to measure this level of learning. So those are broad questions that people look at in uh, cognitive neuroscience. And if I was to go and look at a little um, or a short history, and you'll be, you'll be surprised to know how I started out by putting 
all this, the next three slides that you will see on one slide, and then I gradually had to break them up into three as I discovered more and more people. So uh, in the 80s, uh, when uh, cognitive neuroscience was uh, emerging as a discipline in the West too, there was some uh, pioneering work happening in India, which came more from uh, the clinical end of it, okay? Uh, some of it was started, and some of the earliest work was started by Pratibha Karant at uh, Nimhans when she was looking at uh, individuals with aphasia. Okay, and uh, I mean, all of you who who are from India know that uh, it's never, almost never, a monolingual amongst us. You know, uh, people speak multiple languages; it's the norm. And so, uh, a big question for her was, which language do people use, and when you are in recovery, which is the language that's going to recover from? It's a fascinating question. And you know, almost 45 years later, we still don't have very clear answers to that. There are a number of factors that are responsible for that. And uh, whilst she took this, undertook this work, uh, she also started getting interested in, uh, and there's a body of work that she's done there. Some of the earliest papers in brain and language were in the 80s uh, have been published by her. And then she went on to, to look at autism uh, more closely, you know, starting out from mutism and then going on to study that in autism. And then she left uh, clinical practice to go and set up Deal, which is uh, an amazing organization today in Bangalore that uh, provides very early intervention for children with autism and has done an amazing work of uh, taking this across uh, the country. And uh, the idea is they'd also try and empower uh, parents to be able to participate in this journey very early on as possible. And then we have uh, Shobini Rao, who also worked at Nimhans and uh, worked extensively on cognitive retraining. So again, because of the Nimhans setting where there were primarily patients coming in who were impacted because of stroke or uh, injury or, or some other issues. And, and in order to rehabilitate them, uh, how does one develop good methods to work on rehabilitation. And in that process of rehabilitation, how do you understand learning and cognition as it happens uh, in the brain? And, and in order to do that, she also went on to develop some of the first uh, neuropsychological batteries to be able to assess the learning and recovery as it happened. Shobini came and spent um, a few years at NBRC, and we were very fortunate to have her uh, her guidance and her experience to share with us on, on what the patient population brings, the richness of it, uh, and how much that contributes to understanding human behavior and cognition. And Ashram Gupta was, uh, she's sadly no more. Uh, we lost her to cancer two years ago. But uh, she was uh, this amazing lady at Delhi University who uh, was looking at how uh, children learn to read um, in, uh, in alpha syllabaries of which Devnagari is an example. So these are now called Lakshara-based languages, but some of the earliest work on the challenges of reading uh, visuospatially complex scripts, which are what are prevalent in India. Okay. And uh, she did some very nice work with Jyotsna Vaid, which is uh, cited extensively even today. And uh, an interesting thought that I'll just leave with you for many of you who might read, um, Indian languages too is there's this notion of articulatory sequencing, you know, and so when you encounter um, in Hindi uh, the 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 word kill, you know, the the it's a, it has a choti iki matra which in visual processing appears first, but when you articulate appears later, you actually say it later. And so the brain has to actually keep track of this, you know, something you never encounter in learning to read English, everything just appears sequentially. Okay. Uh, so how does the brain manage this articulatory sequencing and what are the challenges that it poses? So these were some interesting questions that they raised, but these were all primarily from the behavioral level. And then in the in in the two thousands, the, there were a bunch of um, of women, you know, and you can you can see how many women are already getting excited by cognition and behavior, who are setting up labs in different parts of India, you know, looking at different aspects of it. And uh, what gave this work a lot of uh, uh, new visibility also was that uh, there were now uh, good machines available which can which could back up. 
uh, a lot of what behavior was showing and we were able to show neural sub substrates, the time scales at which some of these processes were happening. And that brought in a new excitement into the field uh, completely, okay. So uh, uh, Bindu Kutti continues to work at NIMHANS on sleep, does some work on yoga and consciousness also. Suvarna has done some fabulous work on uh, dementia and the role of uh, multilingualism in even delaying dementia, okay. And, and the different aspects of, uh, of dementia. And so uh, that has given this, this whole aspect of uh, bilingualism and multilingualism as being a protector almost against dementia and aging is now gathering a lot of support in various parts of the world because most parts of the world are multilingual and not monolingual uh, as uh, we are often led to believe. So there's a very rich, rich uh, behavior sitting out there from learning multiple languages and processing them and switching back and forth between them, which uh, has advantages which go far beyond the language domain. So there are transfer effects that we are able to see. Uh, Manjuri Tripathi at Ames uh, has done some fascinating work on epilepsy uh, and with the uh, MEG has act actually taken that to a whole different level with, um, with another colleague also from uh, Ames. But she's also done some very interesting work in Alzheimer's disease, uh, which has brought in a lot of focus on uh, looking also at Alzheimer's disease and memory issues in women. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bhumika Kar, who is at the Center for Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences in Allahabad, uh, has worked on um, cognitive control, uh, linking a little bit back to some work that Suvarna also did, and, and the role of bilingualism. Okay. And again, the, the whole notion of the fact that uh, what starts out as just looking at control in switching languages, to what extent or can those uh, effects have in other domains is something that is now gathering uh, uh, more support and her work with EEG has been quite fascinating. Uh, some of the work in my lab, which started out around 2002, um, started looking at uh, bioliteracy and looking at the underlying uh, networks in the brain. And uh, there, was, there was one interesting uh, finding that we had on how there were cultural differences that emerged because of the structure of writing systems. And it's interesting to know that, you know, many of us who read uh, two languages and two writing systems actually use different strategies depending on the kind of writing system we uh, use. And that comes out of uh, proficiency and usage, you know. And uh, so the, the plasticity of the brain that continues well into adulthood um, becomes quite uh, fascinating to see. Um, then we did some work with, uh, uh, with autism and showed how children with autism were able to process uh, sung speech better than, than uh, spoken speech. And this was wonderful work done by uh, Mega Sharda, another uh, budding cognitive neuroscientist who then went on to uh, actually try and take this into even translation where uh, we were able to show that if you are actually able to implement uh, such things in the clinic, you can actually help children at very young ages begin to articulate and communicate much more. The, the more, the stronger you did not speak, the better the music therapy works with you in at the younger ages. And then some work with ragas and uh, uh, Hindustani music and emotions, which uh, I'm wondering whether Abhishek is part of this, but Abhishek was kind enough to, to cover that. And we did a very interesting um, uh, series on podcast on how we could try and communicate this information to more people across the world, because uh, Hindustani music and ragas is something that many of us enjoy much beyond the Indian uh, community. And finally, the development of Dali, which emerged from our work in uh, uh, imaging and has now um, gotten quite popular across India and in which we are now extending to this calculia also. But this is what took my breath away, you know. There are already so many people, I could find 12 already. And if I searched a little harder, I think this slide would have another uh, six or eight names. But that's where we stand at today. There are those many labs in different parts of India. Uh, that are pursuing ideas in broadly cognitive science and most many of them have overlapped with cognitive neuroscience. Okay? So there's work on music being done by Vinu Aluri, then 
Um, Pratnavali has a lab at Manipal on sleep. Shantala, whom you've already heard, continues to do extremely interesting work on music therapy. Uh, Varsha Singh at IIT Delhi is starting to work on uh, neural mechanisms of and using eye tracking in language. Uh, Kavita is working, and I'm guessing you heard her too, on, on empathy and uh, it's how it manifests uh, in the brain. Madhvi at Ashoka is working with infants. So there's a ton of work that's happening in different parts of, uh, of India. Uh, and a lot of that is being done by amazing women, you know, in the field of cognitive neuroscience. And this was heartening and very, very encouraging. Okay, so I'm conscious of time and I would like to wind up in the next couple of minutes. But I just wanted to list out a few um, open areas that you know are still waiting to uh, be explored and discovered a little more. And, um, and one of these of, is of particular interest to me, social and emotional learning, which is what I'm doing a lot at, at MGIP is trying to take um, uh, the evidence from um, social and emotional learning from the neurosciences. So, so how you can actually train the brain to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to be mindful, and how these uh, practices, if they can be brought into education systems as part of uh, curricula, we might be able to build more resilience in our children. Because that's something that uh, a lot of young children and adolescents are struggling with. So how, relationships probably need to be at the heart of education, not just the cramming of knowledge, because that's what you know really holds you through across life. And, and so that's where a lot of my energies are, uh, are targeted these days. And I just want to uh, leave these open with you that a lot, lot of these areas have implications, not in just the basic understanding of cognition, but also in education and remediation and in rehabilitation. And um, it's extremely satisfying to be able to have helped an individual through some of the research one does. And uh, I would urge you to consider it at some point in time as you further your research. Uh, finally, before um, I end, I think uh, I, it, it would not be fair if I did not mention how important a responsibility we as a community face in also advocating uh, the need for mental wellness and good mental health. Okay. As neuroscientists, uh, I think it is very, very important given the times we live in today that we talk about this and the sciences that all of us do uh, gives us a unique opportunity and voice to be able to do this. And I want to urge you all to also consider doing that as you take your journey forward. And finally, for uh, the sisterhood to be able to support each other. I, if there are any ways at any point in time, we can come back and support each other uh, through this journey. Uh, I think uh, we would have done a lot for the cause of uh, promoting uh, neuroscience in uh, amongst women in India. So I'll stop there and um, just quickly spend a slide talking about Sharika. Uh, who's going to be the next speaker, who's, um, I had the good fortune of also teaching uh, at NBRC. So she did a PhD with Aditya Murthy on um, context-dependent planning of sequential saccades. Uh, and I remember Sharika being an extremely diligent, uh, persevering uh, young lady who uh, battled uh, you know, many things as her supervisor moved across. Okay. Uh, and I think it's been remarkable how well she's done. Uh, she had fellowships uh, at Utrecht and Duke and then a very successful postdoc at UPenn. And I'm delighted that she's back home and uh, will be able to further the, the cause of cognitive neuroscience. And I'm quite fascinated by what she's setting out to do now on the role of affect and its implications and for motivation and decision-making. But uh, just to be able to end on... Um, a personal note, uh, Sharika was an extremely important and active participant of the music club. She sings very well too. And what um, uh, somebody told me yesterday is Sharika loves eating fish, but not other kinds of meat. So those are little tidbits you can keep in mind when you get together for your next uh, in-person get together and have a wonderful meeting.
and this is just half of uh, the human brain being shown here. And what is colored in here shows the anterior cingulate gyrus, um, more uh, labeled here. Than in the, the, the one in red is sulcus and uh, the one in blue is uh, the ACC gyrus. And in a series of fMRI studies here, people have shown how uh, anterior cingulate gyrus uh, in humans has been specifically sensitive to uh, reward in the context of another person. Uh, so it could be high or low probability of reward that it is firing for the net value that is re reward value considering the effort uh, involved uh, and also tracking the uh, learning of other uh, all these different series of tasks seem to activate the HIMS specifically. And it's not very different, uh, it turns out, in case of monkeys, considering the rich homology, uh, brain homology that we share with macaques. Uh, for example, in a, a study where they had lesion, where the authors had lesioned uh, ACC gyrus and sulcus specifically, uh, there were specific social impairments that were found in the ACC gyrus lesions in these monkeys related to uh, how they react to social stimuli uh, and not uh, in ACC sulcus. In, uh, in a series of interesting experiments done in my postdoc lab by Steve Chan, uh, he uh, made monkeys do a decision-making task where uh, the actor monkey could uh, decide to donate some uh, juice reward to uh, another monkey sitting in the room. Uh, the choice was between uh, offering the recipient monkey some juice over no one. Uh, and it seemed uh, like always the actor monkeys prefer to give the juice to the recipient monkey rather than it going waste to another monkey, to nothing. And interestingly enough, ECC gyrus neurons uh, seem to also have, uh, seem to fire preferentially for rewards to uh, self, uh, other, and uh, in, here shown in black is when these cells don't fire to uh, reward going waste. Uh, so there were some neurons that shown, uh, shown in blue that were specifically preferring to fire for uh, reward to other, whereas there were also neurons that were firing equally well for both self and other. So uh, overall, when they looked at the distribution of uh, these neurons in ACC gyrus in the macaques, uh, this is uh, sort of um, plotting the proportion of these di uh, different sets of neurons in three regions uh, that they uh, uh, looked at. One is orbitofrontal cortex, ACC sulcus, and ACC gyrus. And as you can see overall from, as we go from OFC to ACC gyrus, uh, what is shown in red are these self-reference, those who fire preferentially for reward to self. Uh, the proportion of those neurons reduce uh, uh, as we move from OFC to ACC gyrus, uh, whereas the other reference in blue and those uh, firing preferentially for both self and other rewards and not for neither, uh, were increasing uh, as we go from OFC to ACC gyrus. In short, ACC gyrus neurons seem to have a significantly more proportion of other and both referencing uh, neurons as compared to ACC sulcus, for example. Um, but as we know, uh, for a healthy social interaction and behavior, we need to be cognizant of not only the rewards of others, but also uh, the negative outcomes that the uh, conspecific might be going through. And that sensitivity helps us to build on uh, our social relationships, act pro-socially, be empathic, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I was interested in looking at this uh, distinction between tracking uh, others' positive versus negative outcomes in this uh, context. Uh, for tracking others' negative outcomes, one very popular model has been uh, pain, and the empathy of pain has been studied in humans uh, variously. And one pioneer paper, pioneering work was done by Sundar et al., where they showed for the first time that ECC, ECC uh, and insula, another region in the uh, both uh, hemispheres of the brain, has been. Uh, 
marked here, the bilateral anterior insula. And ACC seem to be firing for the affective component of pain, uh, not the sensory uh, dimension of pain. While someone was empathizing with uh, a con another person uh, who was going through uh, the pain in the uh, while the uh, empathizer was being scanned uh, in FRI. Uh, so ACC's role in empathy of pain has been shown uh, in human fMRI studies. And more recently, uh, analgesics like uh, acetaminophen, which is an active ingredient in paracetamol, had been reported to reduce this activity in anterior cingulate cortex and insula uh, following a social exclusion in a, a cyberball task. And this, this uh, figure here shows the decrease in uh, uh, activity of ACC, ACC and insula uh, in this task following uh, those of uh, acetaminophen. And uh, since then, there have been a couple of other human work showing uh, that is, uh, the acetaminophen or painkiller has a tendency to blunt uh, both positive and negative uh, outcomes associated with others. So uh, in my mind, I had three goals, uh, therefore lined up, uh, which was one to first uh, design a valence based decision making task for uh, monkeys that would uh, help us analyze their behavior for self and other in these contexts. Uh, record from macaque anterior cingulate gyrus uh, while the monkeys perform this task and also test the effect of painkiller acetaminophen on task performance as well as the neural activity in ACC gyrus. So let me quickly uh, go into that. Uh, this is a rough task design, two monkeys in the room, one monkey making the decisions for the other as well as himself. Uh, while he's looking at the uh, objects that are shown to him on the screen. And the task is, okay, so it's the decisions are made using a joystick and the monkey, as well as the other uh, unspecific in the room, uh, gets two types of uh, juice reward, which can be positive or negative. For positive, it is a fruit juice, and for negative, we uh, offered them a diluted wine, which is a bit bitter in taste. The task was a simple overall idea. I don't want to get into the details, but the overall idea is that the monkey has to choose the amount of uh, juice uh, that he would go for uh, in each trial. And the juice that he would uh, get at the end of every trial was cued in the beginning by this color, which is a reward cue. It could be one of the four types, uh, signaling not only the type or the valence that is good tasting versus bitter tasting, uh, but also who would get it. So red and blue meant that he would get either good tasting juice or bad tasting juice. And the magenta and green suggested that the other monkey would either get good tasting or bad tasting juice. So uh, the only way this monkey would know whether the outcome for the other monkey was uh, good or bad was by just observing the other monkey in the room after the reward was given. Uh, and uh, it seems to have worked as I will show you in the um, uh, results. So these are the behavioral results. What I plotted here is the percentage of trials that the monkey does not end up completing. So uh, as you can see, the percentage of such unattempted trials is very low when the reward is for himself and good tasting. But in all other conditions, that is self bad tasting and other good tasting and other bad tasting trials, this proportion of unattempted trials is much larger. What is interesting is that after a dose of acetaminophen, uh, these monkeys uh, seem to be more tolerant of the bad taste uh, and also more uh, motivated to uh, attempt these trials in the other good and other bad conditions. So that was an interesting result. Uh, we ran the whole data into uh, mixed model GLM. And overall, to keep give you one line result, acetaminophen did not seem to care specifically about uh, the valence that was uh, associated with the uh, outcome, but it increased the frequency of attempting these trials regardless of uh, valence as well as the recipient. Next, we go down to the uh, physiological results. Uh, for to give you a brief introduction of what 
happened, we recorded from the anterior uh, cingulate gyrus of macaques so using a pretty four channel probe. And uh, for those of you who would like some visual depiction of how it might look. So this is the probe when passed on uh, down into the brain, it records from um, the, the electrical activity, the transmembrane current in that region, extracellularly, and it can, uh, the, the summation of all the currents that are in the vicinity are picked. The small microenvironment is being picked by uh, this electrode. And uh, this, if this is how the raw signal looks, it can be uh, then broken down into high frequency spikes that we are more familiar with. Uh, and also the slowly varying uh, lo local field potential signals. Uh, that is what uh, we will be looking at. So of course, local field potentials can be examined in the uh, time domain as well as the frequency domain. We chose to look at the uh, frequency, uh, how frequently the oscillating signal changes in LFPs. Uh, in the band of uh, 8 to 12 hertz, which is the alpha band, uh, primarily because this was the uh, uh, alpha band is what has been shown to be sensitive to empathic uh, behavior in human EEG studies. So you can think of LFP as micro EEG. It is EEG at a very, uh, with a very high spatial resolution as compared to EEG. Uh, okay, so first results, uh, we looked at whether the LFP alpha bar following the juice delivery uh, was able to uh, differentiate between uh, good and bad trials for self uh, as well as others. So we uh, let it run through a classifier and it seems like for both self and other, uh, these are some example sessions, uh, the LFP alpha bar could differentiate above chance uh, whether it was a good trial or a bad trial. But does it really matter? Did it have any consequences on the behavior? For that, we looked at uh, the discrimination accuracy uh, that is plotted on the y-axis here for each session and try to uh, correlate it with the behavioral valence discrimination that the monkeys did uh, in that session. And across sessions, when we plotted that, we found that there was no uh, significant correlation for these self trials, but there was very interestingly for the other trials. So what that means is that the uh, alpha bar uh, LFP is in each session is correlating with the behavioral valence uh, discrimination or the performance of whether the a monkey performed an other good trial or other bad trial, depending on the balance. That is the GLF beta that I um, was talking about earlier. That correlation was significant for other trials. Interestingly enough, um, acetaminophen seems to have um, disrupted that correlation. So, what are the uh, key takeaways? I know this opens up a lot of interesting questions and uh, avenues for future research, but, and this is ongoing analysis. Uh, to summarize the key takeaways from this, one is that painkiller acetaminophen can also ease aversion for taste, uh, it seems, for both self and other trials. Um, local field potentials in ACC gyrus can predict valence of both self and other trials above chance, but the accuracy of this prediction correlates significantly with the behavior only in other trials. So this is consistent with the other specificity of ACC gyrus neurons, and it extends it to the negative domain of others' decision arguments, which is uh, very interesting. Also acetaminophen, we saw disrupts the correlation between how well ACC gyrus LFPs can predict valence and their behavioral uh, significance in other trials. Uh, so this is suggestive of the involvement of pain processing circuits in incorporating unpleasantness in general uh, associated with an outcome into the decision-making process, which I think is super interesting and something to uh, work, uh, something I plan to work on uh, in future. Um, uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. That was fantastic, Sharika. I have so many questions, but I'm going to start by <laughs> giving others some chance because we have a lot of time and I'm happy to take as many questions as the audience likes. So 
let's start with Malvika, which we have, which I have up in front of me. I think she basically spoke. She basically basically said what we've had at the top of our heads for the duration of your talk, which is. Um, isn't Tylenol an over-the-counter for physical pain? <laughs> and if it reduces empathy, would it also have some effect on someone who's going through psychological pain? Yes. So that is the actually interesting uh, research and that grabbed a lot of uh, eyeballs when it came out at, uh, in the human uh, behavior and fMRI studies. And I think it's interesting. It, it is uh, being reported in... Uh, as with acetaminophen, um, Tylenol, but uh, we can imagine uh, that it's opening these uh, interesting research questions about painkillers in general, because uh, what we are finding is that painkiller is not only sensitive to sensory pain, uh, but also to unpleasantness in general, which can have uh, good and bad uh, consequences, right? So uh, I'm choosing to look at the good side of it, that uh, considering we know uh, so much more about pain biology and uh, uh, pain perception, probably to a lesser extent, but pain in per se, as opposed to psychological pain or unpleasantness in general, uh, the fact that these pathways might be overlapping allows us to uh, potentially reduce uh, psychological pain using these uh, known uh, biomolecules. So that I think is very interesting. Most definitely. I'm going to insert my question, well, my question or what I took away from the talk here. For me, it looks like um, the fact that you use acetaminophen in your study and what you see as a result in like imaging studies, for me, it speaks a lot about um, what acetaminophen does at the cellular level and what it does yeah. at the circuit level, right? Because there's one thing that it's a non-steroidal sort of drug and, and then it helps to like ease inflammation, it helps to ease pain, uh, but mm -hmm. what it does specifically to brain circuits and that to different circuits and different regions of the brain, because I think what you've managed to answer like very <laughs> elegantly. And of course, as, as all good results, you know, we're always surprised by it. So yeah, I, I found it amazing. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for, for saying this and for like explaining your work. Um, I'm going to take uh, one question from Ankush Chakraborty that just came out. Uh, he says, fantastic talk. Other than the ACC, did you find other brain areas lighting up in the fMRI? Uh, in the human work, yes. Insula, anterior insula also seems to. So both anterior insula and ACC have been implicated in the salience network, as we uh, know. So both, as well as empathy for pain. So it is interesting that uh, acetaminophen was able to reduce activity in both these regions. Um, we, we don't know. Uh, so, of course, they are uh, functionally connected as well, but as of now, we don't know uh, at the neuronal level uh, what acetaminophen does to insulin. No, that's, that's definitely cool. For me, you said insulin, and I, like, I instantly thought about taste, and I'm thinking, oh, but they're getting like uh, bitter juice and like regular juice to right, right. probably related, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, so that is something that actually we are interested in looking at next, if it is taste specific or not. Perfect. Um, one last question from Abhishek. Um, that's, uh, Dr. Sharika, that's a very interesting research angle. I have a tangential question. Among primates, do you consider macaques as particularly interesting animal models and why? Among primates? Do mm -hmm. you say? Okay. Among primates, yeah. do you consider macaques as particularly interesting animal models? Uh, I think they're, I mean, I, I think all other primate brains are equally interesting. It is just that we are able to access them um, with using our uh, state-of-the-art invasive uh, recording setups. Uh, so, so that makes, that increases the value in scientific research more. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think uh, old world monkeys are, uh, and higher, uh, if I can use the word higher, uh, I'm sure they have all, have very interesting brains and uh, they obviously show very interesting set of uh, behavioral repertoires. So no yeah, such failures sure. as such. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was, um, in my head it also came up that, you know, Reese's macaques are like almost endemic in India. So it's exactly, like yes. 
easier model system to choose, right? We, um, yeah, we would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Um, how does a social reward, I'm just continuing on because I wish you added another question, but how does social reward relate to other rewards like food or sex? And is the cingulate cortex more involved in social reward than sort of these other rewards? Uh, actually, yes. So that is, uh, that is how the, the, I think we've seen uh, ACC is getting active in the context of social reward uh, specifically, whereas for other uh, domain generic uh, positives, we know the striatum seems to, ventral striatum seems to light up more often. That seems to be more uh, domain generic in that sense. Um, but also, I think, of course, I, I spoke about uh, the specificity of ACC gyrus in the social context, but I think probably I should maybe emphasize that ACC. Uh, is also in some sense, even in, for example, the work uh, I showed you, acetaminophen seems to not care specifically about one valence, but anything that is salient in some sense. And that has been shown in uh, interesting experiments done in rats too. Uh, so I think the role of ACC and insula as, uh, as you know, part of the salience network also has something to do with uh, the way uh, rewards are processed. So, of course, in the social reward case, we saw ACC gyrus uh, in relation to others' rewards to be specific. But I think looking at a broader perspective, like a uh, broader viewpoint, uh, it is interesting to note that ACC per se is a hub for many things. So it is at uh, it is talking to so many different uh, regions that are participating in executive control and uh, action. So uh, I would say like coming back to your question that uh, whether it is uh, only specific to social reward uh, per se, it's, it's because we are choosing to look at it uh, at a very uh, small uh, lens that if, if you're looking for specificity, we are finding it. But of course, it is doing much more uh, as, uh, as a whole, is probably what I want to say. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. And sort of looking at it from the cortex, because as a rodent neuroscientist, I, I can tell you, for example, that a lot of like people who work on rats and mice tend to look at it like from, I know, for a lack of a better term, bottom up. Like we always think, oh, amygdala is important because. Yeah, know, and that's, that's all it is doing. Yeah, so that's. Exactly. That's, so exactly. Really, and, yeah. and then people look at the striatum and dopamine for like positive things. And yeah, we, we all do. But like for us, mm -hmm. for example, if you ask somebody from our field, they'd be like, yeah, it just seems to, seems to go to the cortex. And then we don't know what happens. <laughs> so it's so <laughs> nice to see it from like a top down view and see what happens yeah. in circuits in the cortex. So thank you. That yeah. was. Wonderful, as always. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up with you later. Yes, <laughs> yes, let's do that. Thank you once again. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye. Uh, right, now it's time for um, our fourth invited speaker of the day. Uh, please extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Yogita Adlakha. Uh, she's a Serb research scientist at the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, SISPI. Uh, she and her team work on understanding the impact of maternal micronutrient deprivation on fetal brain development and whether and how prenatal complications converge upon poor brain development by employing molecular and genetic analysis on retinal organoids. Uh, she's also a 2020 Tulsa by Somani Educational Trust Awardee. Congratulations, this is very recent, and a young associate of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, today, she's representing the neuronal development subfield and we'll give a talk on the role of miRNA in neuronal development by analyzing various disease and neurodegenerative disordered models using retinal organoids. Dr. Yogita, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and take it away. Uh, we still can't hear you, so I'm gonna wait until you're on mute yourself. Can you say something for us? So good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to organizers who are organizing this meeting at such an early hour of morning. 
and I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk at such a fabulous platform where all the speakers are women. And so I'm Yogita Adlaka. I work at Translation Health Science and Technology Institute. And today I will present the work that has been carried out at National Brain Research Center. Uh, while I work there as DST Inspire faculty, I will also give a glimpse of the work that I pursued uh, during my postdoctoral studies at uh, National Eye Institute, NIH, USA. And uh, first two slides are just based on my opinion, my perception after reading the literature. And after that, I will actually present the work on neuroscience. So because I'm giving a talk at a platform where all the speakers are women, so I thought to start my talk with the introduction of highly inspirational and motivational lady Savitri Bhai Phule. Why I picked her? Because I pursued my PhD from Pune University and its name is recently been changed to Savitri Bhai Phule University. And she is recognized as first female teacher of India. And despite all the odd conditions, she continued her efforts to educate and empower young girls and women of any caste. So she has been a role model uh, to several women. So with this slide, I want to encourage, I want to uh, motivate girls and women of any discipline to go for their dream, to go for your calling, because we have got just one life and nobody else will, uh, will do efforts to achieve your dreams and uh, will serve you on the plate. So you have to do all the efforts for your passion, for your calling. So just go for it. Uh, the purpose of showing this slide is just to tell that the genesis of brain science in India seems very old. In ancient India, Vedas have already talked about complex brain functions such as consciousness and how different brain faculties take care of consciousness. Even Garbha Upanishad uh, talks about uh, pregnancy, gestation and fetal brain development. So let's come back to neuroscience. So human brain is highly complex and distinct organ, which is made up of almost 86 billion neurons. And there are neural stem cells, which give rise to neurons and other new non-neuronal cells, such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So neurons are the basic structure and function unit of the brain, which performs the basic function, such as receiving, processing, and sending the information to the target tissue. And human brain development starts very early on during gestation. It starts around 23rd day post conception day, and it continues to develop throughout gestation as well as during the first two years of infancy. And during this period, remarkable transformation in morphology as well as function takes place. So how neural development starts? It starts from neural stem cells, which reside at different locations in the brain. So neural stem cells maintain their population by, by symmetric division. And by asymmetric division, they produce neurons and glial cells. So um, several signaling pathways and genes have been found to be involved in neural development using uh, like uh, notch, wind, and STAT3. But all these findings have been derived from animal models. And any abnormality during the neural development can lead to neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism. And because of the uh, non-availability of human-based brain model systems, molecular signatures associated with these disorders are not clear, due to which clear-cut treatment for these disorders is not available. Therefore, human-based model, brain model systems are the need of the hour to study the pathogenesis of the, of the neurodevelopmental disorders. So understanding human brain development, dysfunction and disease is very critical because we don't have direct access to intact live functioning human brain tissue. So we question, how can we develop a human based in vitro model system to mimic neural development? So induced pluripotent stem cells emerges as an opportunity to derive human neural cells of any uh, of our choice. 
In 2012, Professor Shinya Yamanaka got Nobel Prize uh, for driving induced pluripotent stem cells from adult fibroblast cells by using a cocktail of transcription factor. These iPS cells are just like embryonic stem cells and they can be converted or differentiated into uh, uh, somatic cells like cardiomyocyte, adipocyte, or neurons. So we derived uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from peripheral blood via the positive isolation or positive selection of CD34 positive cells. These CD34 positive cells were reprogrammed uh, by the application of transcription factor into induced pluripotent stem cells. These induced pluripotent stem cells then differentiated into human neural stem cells and these neural stem cells were differentiated further into neurons. All these cell types were stained positive for their respective marker in cell culture. Uh, I hope the audience know a lot about microRNA, so I will just introduce a little bit uh, uh, about microRNA. MicroRNA belongs to a class of small known small non-coding RNAs, which regulate gene expression by binding to the three prime UTR primarily and cause mRNA cleavage or translational repression. They regulate a number of biological process and any dysregulated expression or function can lead to severe diseases uh, such as neurological diseases. And the fundamental role of microRNAs in human neural development is largely unknown. Several studies using animal models have shown the involvement of microRNA in neural development. For example, starting from the proliferation of progenitors to their differentiation into neurons, to their maturation, as well as neuronal organization, several miRNAs have been found to function at specific stages uh, during the gestation period as well. So in one of our microRNA screening using human uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, neural stem cells, and neurons, we found that microRNA 137 was downregulated in neural stem cells as compared to iPSCs and neurons. We wonder why it is happening because microRNA 137 is a brain enriched microRNA. And literature suggested that this microRNA regulates proliferation and differentiation of neural stem cells as well as dendritic morphogenesis and spine development. But all this literature is based on, again, using animal models and cell lines. And uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, as well as chromosomal microdeletion of microRNA 137 host gene uh, associates this microRNA to several neurological disorders, such as schizophrenia and autism. However, the role of microRNA 137 in human neural development is not known. So we question, what is the role of microRNA 137 in human neural stem cell phase determination and what are the underlying molecular mechanism? So we took neural stem cells and we overexpressed microRNA 137 by transfecting mimic as well as we inhibited microRNA 137 expression by transfecting inhibitor into neural stem cells and then we performed the functional assays. So we determined the proliferation of neural stem cells in, pres in presence of microRNA 137. And we found that the number of proliferating cells or number of Ki67 positive cells were reduced in presence of microRNA 137 at 40 nanomolar concentration. We next determined the effect of microRNA 137 on differentiation of neural stem cells. And we found that at day fifth of differentiation, the punctate expression of DCX, which is the early marker, which is the marker of early neurogenesis, and touch one, which is the marker of early neurons, increased in presence of 40 nanomolar uh, mimic concentration. We next investigated the um, expression of other neuronal markers in presence of MIR-137, and we found that the transcript levels of proneural markers, such as Robo2, Spoke1, DCX, increased in presence of MIR-137. And MIR-137 also increased the expression of other neuronal markers, such as TOUCH1 and MAP2. Protein levels of TOUCH1 were also increased in presence of MIR-137, and anti-MIR was able to abrogate this effect. So we wonder uh, uh, and we question whether MIR-137 has any impact on the migration of neurons in HINSEs. And using neurosphere cell culture, we found that MIR-137 not only increases the migration of neural, uh, neurons, but also increase the sprouting of neurons from the neurospheres. So all these results 
indicate that MIR-137 promotes the differentiation of neural stem cells into neurons, but what is the mechanism? We don't know that. Neurons are uh, metabolically highly active cells, which depend upon mitochondria to satisfy their energy needs. So whether and how mitochondrial dynamics are regulated by MIR-137, we didn't know by that time. So we overexpressed microRNA 137 and we checked the expression of different mitochondrial biogenesis pathway proteins. To our surprise, uh, MIR-137 reduced the expression of key uh, marker of mitochondrial biogenesis pathway, that is the PGC1-alpha. However, it increased the expression of other key players of mitochondrial biogenesis pathway, such as NRF2, TFAM, and SART1. So to further confirm this, uh, we stained our cells, transfected cells with mitotracker green, and we found that the uh, mitochondria content increased in presence of MIR-137. Mitochondria DNA content was also increased in presence of MIR-137. Because now uh, uh, when neural stem cells differentiate into neurons, uh, then the, there occurs a metabolic shift between the prevalent glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. So we wondered whether MIR-137 has any effect on oxidative phosphorylation because mitochondria uh, number is increasing, mitochondria DNA is increasing. So we next uh, investigated uh, the effect of MIR-137 on oxidative phosphorylation. And using seahorse experiment, we found that the basal respiration and maximal respiration was increased in presence of MIR-137. And beside that, MIR-137 also increased the fusion and fission of mitochondria. So thus, uh, while it is converting neural stem cells into neurons, it is also taking care of the machinery to be available for neurons uh, to satisfy their energy needs. Because microRNA normally function by targeting a particular gene, so using bio, bioinformatic algorithms, we found that MEF2A was a predicted target of MIR-137. Uh, MEF2A was very interesting uh, target of MIR-137 because it is also uh, an upstream transcriptional regulator of PGC1-alpha. So we found uh, that MIR-137 binds to a particular site in the 3' UTR of MEF2A, and this site is um, conserved across species. Using luciferase assay, we found that MIR-137 binds to a particular site in MEF2A, and MEF2A protein expression was decreased in presence of MIR-137. So these results conclude that MEF2A was our target of MIR-137. So based on these results, we proposed a model that MIR-137 promotes the differentiation of neural stem cells into neurons. And in doing so, it downregulates MEF2A, which is the transcriptional activator of PGC1-alpha. So thus, it also downregulates PGC1-alpha. It upregulates NRF2 and TFAM and also upregulates biogenesis and oxidative phosphorylation of the mitochondria. It also um, increases uh, mitochondria fusion and fusion. So all these events takes place during the differentiation of neural stem cells to neurons by MIR-137. And this study was published in stem cells and our study also made uh, the, uh, the journal cover page. So now I will switch gear and I will present the postdoctoral work that I carried out at National Eye Institute and where I learned some techniques that I am currently employing in my research. So retina is considered as a window to the brain and loss of sight is uh, a very, uh, uh, is a very, uh, it's a, it's a disability, very fear disability. And retina is the innermost light sensitive part which is present on the back of the eye. It is made up of six types of neurons which are arranged in three nuclear layers. These are outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer and ganglion cell layer. And there are photoreceptors which are the neurons which are the light sensitive neurons present in uh, outer nuclear layer. There are two types of photoreceptor, rods and cones. Rods, they are responsible for the dim light vision and cones, they mediate the color vision and high visual acuity during bright vision, during bright light. 
so uh, there i was involved in uh, studying liver congenital amaurosis and zubia syndrome so for uh, light, efficient light detection photoreceptor harbor a modified type of cilium which is known as outer segment these outer segment are packed with membranous disc and the component of phototransduction machinery so in these diseases these are retinal degenerative diseases which are considered under the broad umbrella of ciliopathies because there occur defects in primary cilia biogenesis or function so due to uh, the defect in the cilia or the uh, outer segment this photoreceptor are unable to perform its basic function of phototransduction so due to that visual impairment is commonly observed in these patients so one third of patient carry a mutation in sept290 gene this gene is involved in cilia biogenesis and transport function though mouse sept290 mutants are available which can recapitulate some of the features of the disease but the precise uh, biological impact of human sept290 mutation is not known so what we did we did the disease modeling of these degenerative uh, diseases and we derived ipscs from lca and zobier patient and control subjects and to study the pathogenesis of the disease we um, uh, used 3d culture and we differentiated these ipscs into retinal organoids in 3d culture and maintained them for almost 200 days so uh, with the help of a microscope with the, we found that um, uh, the thickness of the retinal layers in lca patient and jsrd patient was reduced as compared to control organoids and the migration of neurons was particularly defective in jsrd patient as control, as compared to control organoids and rna seq results suggest that our organoids recapitulated the in vivo retinal development stages so i will conclude my talk uh, in the following points so our human neural stem cells which we derived from induced pluripotent stem cells serve as a model to study neurological diseases because we can modulate we can uh, knock out or we can over express any gene which is related or associated with a particular disease So MIR-137 affects human neural development, and it reduces the proliferation and enhances differentiation of human neural stem cells. And microRNA-137 accelerates mitochondrial biogenesis and oxidative phosphorylation, and thus it also uh, it also uh, acts as a part of energy homeostatic pathway. Uh, with this talk i would like to acknowledge my mentors who showed me the path during my journey of scientific exploration professor yogendra singh from csir igib who is now at uh, university of delhi uh, he supported me well during my phd as well as he guides me now during my career uh, dr anand swaroop from national eye institute nih who believed in me and provided me opportunity to work and learn um, retinal organoids uh, my collaborators uh, at nih and um, houston university and friends and lab colleagues and my mentors from national brain research center dr pankaj said and dr anirban basu who not only helped me with the experiments but also expanded my knowledge of neuroscience and help and carved uh, my skills as independent investigator and professor subrata sinha who was the former director of nbrc who provided me all the infrastructure and financial support to carry out my uh, independent uh, work dst for providing me dst inspire faculty grant and sir for giving me research scientist grant and lastly thsti uh, for providing me uh, infrastructure and uh, other support to carry out my uh, next uh, work and thank you all and I'm happy to take questions now. Wonderful! Thank you so much, Dr. Yogesh. That was very fascinating. For me, uh, uh, let me just begin by saying, like making 3D cultures of like patient-derived cells is is a huge thing, and the fact that you managed to do it so well and get like some amount of data is is amazing. So really, kudos to you for that. Um, Thank you. Of course, I will. I will start off by asking one question before anybody else jumps in. I'm taking full advantage of my of my role as a panelist today. 
Um, when you when you showed the uh, Mir 137 data, I was wondering. I thought it was very cool that the mitochondria end up like they actually do more fission and fusion. And since you were checking like so many accessory proteins, I was wondering, um, did you check uh, what the levels of like for example F1 F0 or F0 F1 subunit, like the actual subunit within the mitochondria, uh, the levels of those proteins, do they also change? Um, and did you happen to check at all? Yeah, so we checked uh, complex one and complex three subunits at RNA level only. I couldn't find mm -hmm. antibodies for that because of the lack of funding I couldn't buy. So I checked at RNA level and their expression were increased. Yes. Perfect. No, also thank you for being honest. <laughs> so it is, uh, yeah, so it is already in the paper. So you can have a look at that. Excellent. Yeah, I hope I hope more people end up going to your paper and reading more about it. Um, yeah, we have one question from Annapurna PK. Uh, she asks, is it known exactly at which stage of neural development is uh, MIR-137 involved? And could it be involved in adult neurogenesis too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. There is a study which suggests that MIR-137 is also involved in adult neurogenesis. And in this study was published in 2010 using adult brain and again um, it was using uh, they used the animal models and they suggested that in animal models adult brain microRNA 137 reduces sorry increases proliferation and reduces differentiation so 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 based on these studies context dependent roles of microRNA 137 have, has been suggested no, that's very fascinating. I mean, yeah, over development is always a time when you have to increase your progenitor population versus, you know, going for differentiation. And I think that switch is very, very uh, fascinating I mean, in, in any brain development, not just in human brain. No, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you so much once again. Uh, there might be some more questions that pop up either in the chat or in the Q&A box. So feel free to sort of type answers to them uh, if you're still around. Uh, we'd be happy to have you until the end of today's session. Sure, sure. Thank you again. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. Let's move on to our next speaker. It's time for our fifth invited speaker. Uh, please extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Vasudharani Devanathan. She's an assistant professor at ISAT Tirupati, and she works on identifying the role of glucose in adult neuritogenesis and uh, to try and understand the regulatory mechanism and neurodegeneration in diabetes, cell adhesion molecules, and um, neuronal membrane protein. Now she's received the 2019 ISA Tirupati Faculty Recognition Award and was nominated as the 2018 to 2022 DAR Research Ambassador. Um, and today she's representing the neuronal cellular and molecular biology field and will give a talk on identifying the role of glucose in adult neuritogenesis and to understand the, the regulatory mechanism involved in normal and altered glycemic condition. Uh, Dr. Vachita, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and take it away. Um, thank you, uh, Shruti. Um, <clears throat> it's actually overwhelming to be a participant um, in this platform. Um, I think I quote Yogita what she just mentioned, and uh, I wholeheartedly would like to thank you and the Bias Watch team, Vaishnavi, and you know the other members for creating such a platform because I think a lot of us have been really yapping about this and always saying that this is something really needed, but we didn't implement. And I think uh, you have taken a great initiative and implemented this. And thank you once again. And uh, so. Um, yeah, I, I, I was overwhelmed and I couldn't just say no when this uh, invitation came up. So, um, you know, I've been with Aisa Tripathi since 2015. So 2015, August is when Aisa Tripathi was um, started. And that's when I joined as the first biology faculty and our PhD program started in, um, you know, um, June, July 2017. Uh, the first PhD students joined my lab in Jan 2018. So I may not be having an excellent story to share, but we had published few interesting short pieces, uh, you know, protocols or even establishment of cultures and things like that. We wanted to motivate ourselves and the students in the lab and we've made short stories that have been accepted. Um, so I'll share uh, at least one project today, uh, and I will uh, also take you through 
few projects that are happening in the lab. So this is our uh, you know, transit campus uh, facility uh, that we are um, right now, um, you know, um, right now located. Um, this is an engineering college in Tirupati and we have a permanent campus coming up near um, Erpedu. Um, you know, that's a little, um, little far away from here, about 20 kilometers. So in a platform like this, I really thought it's important to also give um, some career trajectory. I also talked to the hosts and they said maybe a couple of minutes on this. And I, I'm very happy to share my career trajectory because uh, as women in science, many of us fall back, particularly after marriage or after, uh, you know, kids. And this is a sort of dampening situation for us. And I was no exception. And I, uh, you know, sort of fell back about three and a half uh, years after my uh, training in Germany when I came back to India. And it was very uh, tormenting to think whether I can come to the mainstream academia. And uh, of course, I was promoted by people always my mentors uh, you know uh, helped me in terms of putting my uh, leg again but uh, i was happy to redo it the whole thing again so therefore i'm just sharing it i started as a microbiologist bsc and msc in university of madras uh, back then i mean i completed in um, 2001 uh, and back then uh, microbiology was really fascinating um, we had options of biotechnology and microbiology and having restrictions not to move out of the city or the state i opted to uh, do microbiology and for me seriously at that time was fascinating to understand different uh, bacteria and viruses and to know their pathogenesis and antibiotic resistance so on and so forth i got an opportunity to work as a trainee at tb research center in Chennai, which is right now called as NIRT, which is an ICMR institute. And just after I finished my MSc, I was still not you know, convinced to take up a PhD personally. And I said, okay, maybe I will uh, move uh, to some industrial setup and see what I can do. Um, so I got an opportunity to work with AstraZeneca as a summer trainee. And uh, I mean, now everyone knows AstraZeneca very well uh, due to the current COVID situation. The AstraZeneca Drug Discovery Center was located in, uh, you know, next to Sankey Tank in Bangalore. And I started my uh, traineeship there. While being a trainee, I got to uh, stay as a research assistant. And I also gained good knowledge and actually very quickly could work in BSL-3 facility with the pathogenic H37RV, mycobacterium tuberculosis variant. And this was challenging and so rewarding as a microbiologist because uh, that's something is what you wanted to do. But uh, two years in AstraZeneca, what I understood is be it academia, be it industry, you need to have a scientific rigor. You need to have an excellent training to go up and to think deeply in science. And this is something that place taught me extremely well. And I said, okay, I will now move and do my PhD and then think whether I wanna to go to, you know, academics or industry or whatever. So at that time was, uh, you know, I started um, hearing a lot of uh, uh, neuroscientist lectures and was, uh, very motivated by a lot of popular neuroscience books, uh, Vilano Ramachandran's books and so on. And that immediately said, okay, maybe uh, I should uh, do a slight switch and also want to, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to unravel biochemistry, understand signaling pathways and so more, you know, because microbiology taught me classical things. And I wanted to just go to a little uh, challenging area in terms. And I moved to University of Hamburg, Center for Molecular Neuroscience, where I took up a project on, um, you know, understanding uh, um, um, neurite outgrowth or neurite processes, neurons, um, how they really, how many neurites form, how they extend and uh, neuronal migration. And this was a project that uh, I was quite interested in. I took it up and a postdoc in the lab uh, showed a tentative uh, data wherein she observed a binding between a protein Casper, contact and associated protein, which is also called as paranodin because of its high expression in the paranodal area. So this was discovered in 1999 in Elier Palace lab in Weissman Institute. And by the time I joined this lab in 2004, a few papers had come, uh, you know, uh, a Casper knockout paper and uh, which showed ataxic phenotype and also other interesting um, 
uh, functions of Casper, but most of them pointing out functions relating to, uh, you know, paranodal region and and how in the absence of Casper that uh, sodium channels and potassium channels were really, uh, uh, you know, chaotically disorganized and that uh, you didn't have the junction formed well. I mean, Manzoor Bhatt's group and Barbara Ranch group and Elliot Pellis group had published uh, some of these excellent uh, findings. And that fascinated me. And when we could see this binding of this protein with prion, I could just, uh, I couldn't just wait to take any other project. And I started, um, you know, exploring a bit more on that. And from my PhD thesis, we could show that Casper was important for uh, neurite outgrowth regulation. This was uh, showing sort of a inhibitory cues, as in it tells the neurons to stop when it's grown enough. And uh, that, that the binding of prion, uh, you know, uh, blocked the shedding of Casper. So this binding was really important for a few reasons. A, that the Casper could come to the membrane more. Casper is a transmembrane protein. B, that uh, it was protected from the shedding. So once done, and then I was looking forward to go for my postdoc to the United States, because uh, for me, it was really important to understand how science works in the two best worlds, you know, as a student from India. So I said, okay, Europe, I'm super cool, explored, traveled enough, then I wanted to move to the US. But then comes my marriage where my husband was in Dusseldorf University. I said, well, okay, no problem. I moved to Dusseldorf University and I started working with Bern Nuremberg on understanding GI proteins in brain. So they had a, a knockout at that time, which showed a stroke phenotype. So it's about uh, eight months to one year we invested in understanding, making several sections of the brain from wild type of knockout and trying to see where is the problem and so on. Only after eight months and good brainstorming interactions with neurologists and so on, we recognized it was most likely not from the tissue, but from the cardiovascular, I mean the vascular system, not the cardio, of course, the brain vasculature. So, so uh, then we looked in detail and we understood that GI proteins in the platelets were regulating this um, phenotype, I mean, were, was responsible for this phenotype. And this was uh, shown by transient median cerebral artery occlusion model. I didn't show any of these data because all published and slightly uh, you know, uh, earlier data. So this data was published in PNAS, PLOS One and Journal of Molecular Medicine recently also we published. And the one from um, you know, Casper and Prion, we published in Journal of Neuroscience. Then the group moved to Tübingen. So I moved along with them to University of Tübingen, continuing my work and also eventually became senior scientist. And then 2012 is when I moved back to India as a pregnant uh, woman and then had a maternity relevant uh, issues. And I had to take a break and followed by which I took a uh, you know, long term break about three and a half years. So in 2015, my husband moved to Sun Pharma in uh, Baroda. I started exploring there. And there was this, uh, there is this institute, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Institute for Cell and Molecular Biology, a very interesting institute. And, uh, you know, it has a, a, a good uh, faculty they have uh, taken from throughout the world. And, you know, of course, the MSU faculty, and there are a lot of adjunct faculty who come and teach. And I got a teaching faculty position there. So once I started getting into the academics again, I also applied for a, um, you know, worse position, which I got. And then I was looking for a stable or a proper lab building position. So that's when actually uh, I started hunting, landed up in Aisar Tripathi in 2015. So I, as I said, was the first faculty there. So initial two years spent on UG students teaching, curriculum designing, lab course designing, equipping the UG lab and so on, of course, I didn't have to do it alone. Uh, mentors from ICER Pune, the biology department uh, mentors were greatly helpful. And, you know, we just, uh, we were just one call away to uh, talk to them and know uh, important things. And I think without that, uh, this would have been completely difficult. So all that took about two years. Then October 17, Dr. Harshini uh, joined me as a postdoc. Uh, she brought in expertise from Michigan State and uh, she was also a, retina, a retinal uh, neuron, retinopathy expert. And then uh, Jan 18, the PhD students started. And soon after that, we started, you know, um, looking for how to build up the research uh, lab. We didn't have an animal facility. We still don't have. And I think most of us know that's the bread and butter for neurobiologists. And uh, this was getting very difficult. So we uh, ventured out and of course, leveraged the local area 
and go went to the veterinary institute and started getting sheep brain and you know sort of whatever was available but sheep brain was very interesting because also we could get a very good amount of cells and we did some uh, you know bioinformatics quick look up and we also recognized how sheep brain can be close uh, in terms of you know a lot of proteins were more relatable to the human one and so on particularly the ones we were interested so we said okay this is a blessing in disguise let's go ahead and let's uh, start with that and today we stand with some good eight papers and two book chapters and in the meanwhile the first doctoral student is awarded dhad fellowship and we have a osb for harshini and then a new g student was also uh, you know uh, achi uh, uh, got a corona fellowship to st louis and then came back she finished her thesis went to vbc vienna bio center program and then i as uh, shruti said also uh, was very overwhelmed to get a best faculty award and apart from this i was also into a lot of administrative roles even some of them that i am currently taking care for instance chair of student affairs and mentoring the innovation council for the undergrad students and then i used to be member in anti ragging committee women's cell and i was also a joint admissions committee member representing icer tripathi for the icer aptitude test all icer aptitude test and in the last uh, 10 months of lockdown we have new responsibilities wherein i was a part of a covid testing lab uh, a bsl3 lab that we have established you know icmr a recognized lab here in the campus and a covid task force member now i move on to the science part uh, that i'm uh, looking forward to share so um uh, at that time i wanted to bring something completely new to the indian setup and how to uh, utilize what i have learned and my collaborations from the west to the indian setup and how i can actually contribute because i recognized that seemed to be extremely interesting uh, of course from the national perspective and also from the personal perspective that you get probably better funds because you want to address a local problem and it definitely helps although you know glycemia diabetes and so on is a local indian subcontinent issue it just doesn't confines us to this area it's sort of you know it's an urban problem eventually so we asked ourselves like we should look at as i said we didn't have animal facility so all we could get was adult brain and this is also um, the last 20 years i think the neurobiologists across the world are trying to look at interesting uh, paradigms you know we have uh, excellent papers which came from the uh, i think um, ucsd ucla the west coast area you know talking about um, uh, hippocampal region uh, harboring stem cells and you know very interesting some contradictory some supportive uh, basically thought provoking papers and therefore we started thinking i think this is where we want to create our niche and we will try and look at what's happening in the adult brain particularly in the altered glycemic uh, uh, ecosystem because you know somebody at around 45 50 uh, lands up being diabetic in about 75 years so about 30 years of glucose insult to the brain and then of course you are keeping uh, that under control using drug some of us might remember about 5 years ago there was a cell paper from from denmark where uh, they looked at uh, the effects of um, uh, anti hypertensive drugs in the brain and they came up with fantastic data so i think we are looking at a lot of interesting translational projects as well you know looking at these long term treatments and so on so this area uh, gave me very challenging questions and i said this is what we are going to do and just to highlight some of the uh, interesting points or interesting uh, papers that has been published in the, in this direction and also that we are interested that is how neurotogenesis or how neurites respond to different uh, glucose conditions and later how they will uh, orchestrate the growth cone dynamics in cerebellar neurons or hippocampal neurons or generally any neurons for that matter and um, how the how they affect the synaptic formation and presynaptic response this is something i'm i'm starting to collaborate with the electrophysiologist and we are trying to look at that closely and this is something a phd student in the lab is rightly focusing uh, right now focusing on and also another student is interested in looking at gi protein signaling in neuronal autophagy this is something that i uh, had observed during my post doctoral uh, tenure but we didn't pursue it at that time and i had very interesting observational data so we're trying to now look at it revisit it and see how true or untrue it is and in the long term you know putting some of the findings together we would like to address um 
neuroinflammation or, or neurodegenerative diseases. The long-term goals are still, um, you know, uh, based on what we can understand from our current short-term goals. That's what I would uh, put it this way. But just to start with, this is where uh, we have deeply uh, invested our time in, and I will show you some data from the retinal neuron project that, uh, that we have with one of the PhD students. So the questions that we would like to address, we are addressing right now are the mechanisms regulating neurite processes in adult vertebrate brain and retina. So two doctoral students are working in the brain relevant questions and two are working in the retinal relevant questions. Then we would like to, I mean, we are in discussion with the SV Institute of Medical Sciences and Therapy and some neurologists in Germany to work uh, with them and see implications of uh, the uh, such outcomes in neuronal processes in in somehow in the human level if we can translate or how to how to bridge that gap is what we are trying to initiate and discuss and then the long term goal as i said is implications in cns degeneration so i'll take you through some of the real preliminary data uh, and then bring to today's um, you know current research so we had shown uh, in my doctoral times that you know casper and prion co-localized in the granular layer and molecular layer of the cerebellum. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Casper is uh, accumulating in the paranodal area and it binds to contactin and that's why it's called as contactin associated protein Casper. And that the absence of Casper uh, basically uh, disorganizes sodium and potassium channels uh, resulting in uh, you know, demyelinating disorders and there's some good a substantial paper showing uh, Casper's role in multiple sclerosis and also, um, you know, the knockout is uh, showing a, tax, a toxic phenotype. Then, uh, you know, with all this, uh, when we saw this accumulation and we know the background about Casper, we started looking at uh, the neurite processes in the Casper knockout and the wild type and we could uh, very beautifully observe that in the absence of Casper, uh, increase the neurite length. In fact, I should uh, address that as a PhD student, I was very curious to see a neurite outgrowth promoting molecule. I went to my PA and said, you know, this is so doof. This is really not working. It's like, it's just increasing. She said, but who told you that everything has to promote? You need a negative regulator, as in, you know, something that can send a stop signal. So uh, I got excited. I said, well, okay, what I see is not completely bad and, and, and that motivated me. So when we added antibodies to the neurons, we could retrieve the phenotype essentially. Now, um, you know, with that story in the background, and as I just told you, I had a lot of break in between, I reinitiated in 2015 and we, 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 we you know, establish the retinal neuron cultures here in Aistiripati, and we could maintain these culture about um, 14 to 15 days in vitro. And this was really a good success for us because, um, I mean, there are different protocols and some, some groups have maintained it even longer, but those are from the, uh, you know, developing retina and not this older. In fact, the age of the sheep at that time, we didn't even know. We just got something from the... Um, abattoir and we cultured them and then later we went systematically and told okay we need the fixed age so that we can publish our data and we can think more deeply and that's how we developed the project essentially leveraging things here so we also try to look at the relative expression of some of the important proteins that the lab is interested in some of the uh, important neurite uh, growth regulators so casper one or paranodin casper two contact and prion and how they were expressed in different glycemic conditions. As you notice, this was very interesting to see that um, a significant decrease of some of these proteins uh, were um, observed, or I mean, we could really show that they were significantly reduced in hyperglycemic conditions. But just remember, I told you in the absence of Casper, the neurite length increase. But if the, if the length reduces uh, here, this is like, the absence, I mean, not really the absence. So we, uh, you know, um, uh, we were expecting, um, uh, uh, you know, new right um, uh, increase. And uh, we said, okay, let's wait and see. And I'll show you in a minute that data. Before that, um, you know, we were also looking at immunofluorescence data of all these markers and CAM neuronal cell addition uh, molecule, which is known to bind with prion protein, which is also known to bind with L1, CHL1, and uh, highly uh, known to be uh, in the hippocampal region involved in learning memory 
and so on. Synaptophysin, we all know now, and GFAP for glia. So these are the retinal neurons, and we wanted to show that it's a mixed population, and it was really not a, a single, uh, you know, isolated neuron. We couldn't really achieve that. We are working on that, and we, we are establishing fact sorting, and we are trying to do that right now in the lab. But last year, we had some of these, um, you know, mixed cultures, essentially. So again, uh, we looked at the relative expression of all these um, neurite regulators, neurite or growth regulators, and uh, we could show that they are expressed in, you know, brainstem, cerebrum, cerebellum. These data have been shown by others also. What we uh, show for the first time we observed was in the goat retina, and that was very interesting and encouraging because, for example, you see Casper one is expressed more. And it also uh, led to another question in the lab that what is Casper doing in, uh, in a tissue like retina, which is not that highly myelinated because, you know, brain is way more myelinated and we know the roles of uh, role of Casper in myelin and so on. So such interesting questions that are coming up and, you know, uh, branching projects are happening. I'm not talking about that right now, but uh, back to the slide here. Uh, also, when we compared the goat retina and mouse retina, you may notice that goat retina expressed uh, increased levels of some of the protein that we were interested. So it made sense that we could continue with the goat retinal cells, goat cerebellar neurons, and this was not uh, really a bad situation. So as I mentioned, we also uh, cultured retinal neurons in different glucose conditions and measured the neurite lens. And you can see that in the increased glucose condition, there is um, increased neurite length. Of course, one can say when you increase the glucose, of course, um, in vitro, the neurons are um, immediately happy and they tend to grow longer. But a couple of, uh, I mean, a minute ago, I also told you that the neurite regulators are uh, also reduced. So for instance, red so we don't know still, that's another thing we are uh, deeply looking, whether the reduction of Casper per, per se is the reason for this or any other transcription factor engage. In fact, we have a tentative data where we show that uh, there is a transcription factor which um, uh, theoretically in silico bioinformatics data shows that can bind probably to Casper and maybe that's the way um, the whole process is happening. We are investigating this in detail and um, I don't have a concrete data to show that right now and therefore I'm not showing as well. Um, so what was really important for us at this time was to also have a knockout system. Uh, you know, in the last uh, 10 months of lockdown and so on, we, we were not sure and we don't have animal facility to keep the animals. Uh, so the doctoral student in the lab said we will, you know, establish a CRISPR-Cas knockout system and probably we can transfect into our cells and start with this in the beginning. So uh, I think it was in the third trial, um, she, she could, uh, you know, uh, come up with a clone. And then when this was transfected in N2A cells, you can see all of them. I mean, basically she picked, it was not all transfected in the first, I'm showing the final data and then picked the transfected cells and uh, started culturing it further. I'm not showing too much technical details here. If people are interested, I'm very happy to uh, discuss and share. In fact, um, uh, a week ago, when my student had a research assessment committee um, uh, presentation, I, I learned from Naren and IAC, you know, we could also optimize this further and they had better protocols and we were discussing and thinking how to optimize because we have some technical glitch at the protein level. So we are working on uh, fixing that uh, problem as well. But what was interesting is we could transfect them, we could grow them, and you, we could really observe an interesting morphology. We are quantifying even this right now. So uh, I would say this is uh, somehow the retina uh, story that I have uh, that I can present right now. Uh, but I'll go a little tangential. And from March 2020 to about December 2020, uh, we were on complete lockdown. But um, I and a couple of, uh, you know, Dr. Harshini in the lab, we came to the lab regularly because uh, we were, uh, we got an opportunity to work with IIT in Tirupati. So Tirupati is uh, sort of one of the important uh, highlight or one of the best highlight in Tirupati is that ISER and IIT are not very far away from one another. 
and that we can really learn from each other. So, so IIT folks immediately came up. Uh, we we worked together and thought we should do some COVID relevant uh, contributions, even when we are at home and with limited workspace. We could uh, you know design and come up with these N95 masks. So they had these electro spray technology, you know, the engineering part and the mask for prototype, 3D printing, all that was of course IIT. And this is where my microbiology knowledge came in a bit handy later. And, uh, you know, we could uh, do this. And I think it is in the uh, production level and, and submitted for patent and so on. And we also developed and designed, um, uh, you know, a portable uh, stabilizer. We called it as a BLA, AST blower uh, aided air sterilizer and we uh, also submitted a patent on this so um, this was a very interesting contribution that came up during the lockdown so uh, with this i'd like to uh, quickly summarize although i didn't have a complete story but uh, i could uh, confidently summarize that the retinal neurons can be maintained in vitro about 14 days these are adult retinal neurons uh, you know, the really adult sheep, uh, essentially, and several uh, neuronal markers are expressed um, in sheep retina, as in the neuronal markers that are classically known to be in the hippocampus, cerebellum, cortex, and in the brain, you know, and they were not really looked uh, in the retina. We, we have shown and we have also published this data in Frontiers of Neuroscience, um, uh, Sharma et al., uh, 2019 paper. And then hyperglycemia reduces the expression of several neurite outgrowth markers in retina, and hyperglycemia increases neurite outgrowth in cultured retinal neurons. I mean, we are yet to show the uh, um, transcription factor regulation. We are working on that. Maybe in some time, we are going to send that data out, and maybe by next year, we can talk about that data as well. So uh, this is the permanent campus, upcoming campus. I just want to show, had it not been this uh, current situation, we should be right now. I should have been given the talk from there, but we are way behind. But the student hostel is ready. And a um, few months later, when we are all safe, we could start um, you know, our undergraduate courses, at least here. And the permanent campus will come eventually soon. With this, I'd like to acknowledge um, you know, my collaborators, Dr. Vladimir Sit Sitnik in UNSW, Australia, Professor Melita Schachner in, in Rutgers University, Bern Nuremberg in the University of Tübingen, with whom I was working, GI, and uh, uh, James uh, Clement from JNCSR, and, you know, the lab members uh, for their extreme patience and, uh, uh, and uh, being in the lab at the time we get the brain and retina. I mean, this is... Uh, in personal way unacceptable that the students have to work so hard. But I think in a upcoming and a beginning institute, these are the hiccups one faces, but they are highly motivated. As I said, we have already attracted some international student fellowships. We have applied for several uh, fellowships, you know, uh, research grants. We hope to fetch one or two so that we are not moneyless. I'd also like to thank the director and the chair of Aisar Tripathi for constantly motivating us and not letting us feel that some things are missing. So whatever uh, is missing when we say we would like to do, there's always a supplement. And that's the way forward, I think, from mentorship level. And thanks to the funding bodies, DBT, DST, and uh, yeah, the organizers, last but not the least, for the excellent job and uh, you know, for the patients that they must have had to push people in getting things from them. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. I'm oh, happy to was, take questions. I, I, I'm, I'm going to just take a couple of minutes here because that was a wonderful talk. And, and science aside, I think you touched on so many things that I want to sort of just break it down a little bit and tell people how important it was that you spoke about things that we don't normally speak about, uh, especially in a scientific forum like this. Uh, I, I really, really liked that you spoke about how difficult it is for early career investigators. Uh, we have so many of them in our core organizing team and, and I'm sure they all mirror the, sort of that feeling of helplessness of trying to like get on track or trying to get your lab up and running, especially in a pandemic. Poonam Thakur, for example, is one of the few people who actually had to suffer through the pandemic as she was setting up her lab. And I think- I, I heard that. I mean, 
yeah no it's it's really something and and thank you for speaking out about it because i feel like it's it's something that people don't speak about enough um i i love Shruti, the fact that i should thank you for providing this platform <laughs> and i'm, and, I'm you know, more than um, happy it is our privilege it is our pleasure um i mean we we bring people together and we hope things will work and we are overjoyed to see that you know things worked out so well and we we've, we've had such a beautiful range of speakers that that i can't even imagine uh, you know how this would have worked out if we'd asked many many more people to come and hopefully if we had actually more audiences sharing this um i was very happy that you spoke about your industry academia jump that is not something that that again speakers speak about um you've had like this nice sort of experience in the industry and you came back to academia most people just jump and then stay there and not go to the other side and you're absolutely right in that it gives you a very different point of view on things right so you you the industry is driven by different things and academia is driven by different things and they're not bad and they're definitely not mutually exclusive and it's so nice that you combine both of them together and I, i hope the students who are watching and and listening realize that that you know industry and academia are not exactly opposite to each sorry yeah. to each other and, yeah yeah and i think both of them need rigorous science exactly. definitely that's exactly. the backbone the, yeah. just the way you address is slightly different and I, i agree with you yeah absolutely yeah and also um i it takes courage and it takes conviction to talk about actual personal problems as a woman in science the fact that you spoke about the two body problem you wanted to go to the us but you had to stay back in bisseldorf um thank you for being honest about your maternity issues not something yeah. women usually talk about but it's so important because it affects your professional life and it affects your yes. career trajectory and and we need more people like you to come forward and speak about it because if you don't how do we build solidarity how do we build community yes, yes. um we need to tell people uh, it's not just you suffering it's not a suffering also it's a part, yeah. i mean i don't want to use the word suffering often i say that it's it's a part of your natural uh, you know biological existence exactly. we have to do this you know yeah. it was my conscious option and therefore i have to fight at at a different uh, angle and that's okay it brings you rewards a yeah. little later of course i can't i can't apply for a lot of awards you know i'm already 43 i know this well but that's okay i mean it just you need to balance it somewhere So. no i'm 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 glad i'm so glad you brought it up because we also want to normalize this conversation so that people don't see it as a suffering i mean it it the system should help you the system should should bend around you to to make it easier for anybody with a different background i won't even say different all of this diversity has to be normalized we are all different people and that's hopefully a small bit of that is is what we're trying to do with this conference and and i hope we somehow manage to do it at the end of it all um yeah. thank you for highlighting the teaching the admin and the service work again this is something we always discuss uh, women are disproportionately burdened with it uh, i i don't know how true it is for newer institutes and i don't know how true it is for like settled sort of very big big name institutes but uh, women are always saddled with things that are not research oriented and it, it's in, really in my case i have to be honest i have also voluntarily taken uh, most of it because i wanted a bit more challenge i said i know i will mellow down as my son grows up and this is a time he doesn't really require me i'll push myself to some and and that extent. is that is so much credit to you right i mean you coming forward and you volunteering your time and you yeah, the system here provided me that platform in fact to exactly. be honest i was the only one with the kid still i could get a room space for a day care because i told uh, you know the the chairs today it's me but i'm sure even the men needs need it and we have men using the day care right so yeah. i said we need it and i'm glad Uh, in a way all icers look at it in a good way uh, this is a very important part of the icers system that is fantastic and many I other mean, institutes yeah no right from the get go i'm really happy that i said dirpati was able to give you and support like you said support you where you need it and not just sort of burden you with like all the things that you should be doing anyway um yeah. and personally i i think what really touched me was you had the courage to to sort of start something brand new and keep in mind that you are 
an, a, a researcher in, in, in an environment that's around you. And the fact that you were able to, again, take advantage of what was available and sort of be sensitive enough to say, okay, let's th think of a question that applies to the population around me. Um, and I think that's, it, it's, it's so often, like as basic scientists, we get so lost in sort of the nitty gritties of, of scientific questions. But yeah, it takes, it takes another, I think it, it, it takes courage to take that step back and say, let's look at the bigger picture and let's do something new. I mean, the same for your COVID pivot. Again, uh, very few people spoke about what they did during the last year where things were just falling apart, like breaking apart, right? In terms of labs, in terms of money, in terms of fellowships, in terms of students. Uh, but it's so nice to see that you have a wonderful group that supports I, I asked you. Harshini last evening, should I just show this one COVID data? Maybe people think it's not relevant to neuroscience. She's like, why not? It's all science. Exactly. Should I go for it? I said, okay. I'm so glad. Harshini, if you're listening, thank you very much. This is exactly what we needed to hear. We are a team. You may notice the lab is 80% uh, girls. The boys are a bit uh, upset. I say, we'll bring in more boys. Don't worry. Absolutely. We'll be we'll balanced. You know. <laughs> Gender parity in the in the other direction is also <laughs> definitely needed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for all of that. I know these are all non-scientific points, but they are part of our scientific life and they need to be brought up. And I'm and I'm very happy you did. And, and I'm very happy I got a chance to, to address all of this. Um, I, I will see if we have any questions that I can pull yes, up. One, uh, um, yeah. Yes. So we have one uh, from Annapurna PK. And she says, amazing talk and journey, Dr. Vasudharani. Is there a way of maintaining sheep retina intact in culture to establish something like an ex vivo model? Yeah. So, so um, I mean, we are right now... Uh, actually doing that transition. We started with explants and I, I should be honest again, the first two, three um, uh, things, uh, two, three cultures didn't work because uh, from these guys whom we get, they don't really tell uh, uh, the age and it turned out one of the sacrifice was pretty much in a hypoxic condition and obviously you wouldn't get anything. So, but we can't go stand there. They, just, they don't allow you. So a lot of these small technical issues are there. So we got some rats from Bangalore. As I said, I don't have animal facility to keep. So a lot of um, minor chaos happened and we couldn't uh, succeed. But the third time we went to swims and we said, hey, you know what? We have an MOU with you. We need to work. And then we worked with them. I think uh, um, we could maintain it for five days. We are still trying to uh, uh, rework on the protocol. The doctoral student mentioned that uh, there was some delay in the sacrifice and uh, culturing itself. I remember as an experimental person, when I was working, we had to be really quick. And this is a new student in the lab. So she said she was a little too slow and so on. So I, from, from published data, I know it's not extremely difficult. People have done this across the board and we want to do it here. And we're also interested in moving towards retinoids. Uh, that's, that's something that we have in mind. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I work with, um, we just started, in fact, she's teaching in my course, uh, Nibetita Chatterjee in um, Shankar Netralaya in Chennai, a retina uh, specialist. She teaches here. So we were discussing how we can work together and establish this. So we are in that direction. So to answer your question straight, People have shown it well. It's it's not that difficult. We are trying to establish it. We are having difficulty. And the other question I think somebody is asking is, uh, how difficult was it to establish retinal neural cells in culture? Quite easy. Quite easy. We tried everything. And the reason uh, the retinal story picked up first was because it's is uh, in culture. The, the cerebellum and hippocampal is very difficult. Really? Well, yes, I'm, I'm sure people in the audience who do it will, will attest to this. that fact. <laughs> yeah, no, this, uh, is, yeah. This, is, this was wonderful. Thank you again for, uh, for all your time and for, for being so honest. Um, please feel free to monitor the chat. I see you already are. If something comes yeah. up in the Q&A, again, you can, you can literally go there, type your answers as you see fit. So uh, thank you very thank much you for joining us again. And we hope you hang around for the breakout rooms because I have a feeling lots of people are going to have Absolutely. questions. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye -bye. Thank you. So um, 
Excellent. So we move on to our next speaker. Uh, she is the final invited speaker for the day. Please extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Koyal Das. Uh, she's an associate professor at ISAB Kolkata. Uh, she and her team work to understand the correlation between neural and behavioral activity during decision making uh, in a visual perceptual task and to analyze the role of face and emotion processing in autism spectrum disorder or ASD along with the feasibility of using EEG uh, as a neural marker for ASD. Uh, she's also the recipient of uh, DVT Ramalingaswamy Fellowship and the Emulex Cal IT2 Fellowship uh, from Emulex when she was at UC Irvine. Um, and she's representing the systems and computational neuroscience field today, as you can see. Um, and we'll, she'll give a talk on understanding how individual decisions can be combined to form group decisions and how uh, aggression rules work, uh, sorry, aggregation rules work uh, in combining uh, neural decision variables. Um, so Dr. Das, thank you again for accepting our invitation and take it away. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, let me start off by uh, thanking uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be a part of such uh, an unique initiative. This is my first time speaking at such an initiative. Hopefully it won't be the last since I have the fortune or misfortune of being the last speaker. So let me start right away. So I'm going to talk about um, the phenomenon of wisdom of crowd or group decision and how we, in perceptual decision making. So before I start, as per the request of the organizers, I'm going to share um, you know, a couple of minutes about my uh, journey so far. So um, let me start off by giving the standard disclaimer that has been shared by some of our speakers. So I am uh, what you call a quote unquote fake biologist in the sense that my background is in actually electrical engineering. So I am originally from Calcutta, as it was known then. And then I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering from Assam Engineering College in Guwahati. Uh, at this point, I should mention that uh, it is here that I kind of became very aware of the skewed gender ratio uh, in the STEM field. So we were a class of 30, out of which five of us were girls. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this ratio actually only deteriorated as throughout my academic career. And unfortunately, currently, I am the only female faculty in the department, uh, not for lack of trying. But anyways, so after my uh, engineering, so I went to the United States to pursue further studies. So I went to Wright State University where I did my master's and also in electrical engineering where my thesis was on speaker identification and speech processing. Then I moved to uh, UC Irvine for my PhD where I actually started in computer graphics, but then I shifted gear and I moved to computational neuroscience. And uh, my thesis work was, was mainly algorithmic. So we designed algorithms for processing large scale data mainly neural signals to be used in brain computer interface or BCI under uh, Professor uh, Zoran Nenadich. So uh, by this point of time, I decided to pursue a career in academia and uh, I wanted to return to India uh, and open a full fledged lab. So I wanted for my postdoc uh, an opportunity where I could actually learn how to do experiments, design experiments and then analyze signals so that don't have to depend on others for you know giving me data just for analysis so i was very lucky to have uh, found a postdoc opportunity uh, at ucsb um, under uh, dr miguel Eckstein. so after a very fruitful uh, postdoc experience i returned back to india and i joined iser kolkata where i have been for the past uh, eight years or so i think and uh, so enough about me. So let me start uh, with the actual talk. So I'm going to talk about wisdom of crowds uh, and how we use it in perceptual decision science. So uh, for those interested, there's a very nice book by uh, the American journalist uh, Jem Suruwaki, which came out in 2004. It talks about uh, 
the effect of wisdom of crowds, uh, how group decisions can be used, and it mainly talks about lots of examples from the field of economics, behavioral economics, and psychology. Uh, now, this effect or the benefit of group decision is not unique to us humans. We know of uh, group decisions in other species of animals as well. Uh, we know about uh, groups of honeybees scouting for nest locations, birds uh, navigating in groups, uh, groups of insects foraging for food, and so on. In our daily life, we uh, see examples of group decisions quite frequently, especially with the lockdown. Now, whenever we try uh, to buy some products online, so we generally tend to look at, uh, you know, the review before we buy. So we take our decisions often based on uh, the collective judgment of what it is that we see for the uh, in the online reviews before we buy a product. Okay. So uh, today we are going about to, going to talk about a very recent work um, that we did uh, with Wisdom of Crowds. It just came out this year. So uh, where we use a perceptual decision task and then uh, see the uh, how group decisions can improve um, the performance, both behaviorally and neurally. So most of the work uh, for the uh, uh, project here is done by my wonderfully talented PhD student, Piyasha. I'm just taking the benefit and also by uh, my colleague from uh, my department, Shatuk. So uh, let us start by uh, looking at one of the probably one of the first evidence of uh, wisdom of crowd effect in um, science. So uh, there's this very seminal work uh, by Sir Francis Galton that came out in uh, 1907 uh, called Vox Populi. So here he actually showed that the average guess of the weight of an ox is actually very close to the actual weight of an ox. So the data uh, he received was from a county fair where people present in the fair actually guessed what would be the weight of an ox and there were 787 subjects uh, people and uh, the average of their guess came to uh, 1207 pounds whereas the actual weight of the ox was uh, 1198 pounds so you can see it was quite close all right so since then, there has been a lot of research on wisdom of crowd, both in animal, uh, different species of animals and in humans. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about some of them. So one of the uh, very uh, interesting work came out in 2007 um, by Behrami and others. Uh, so it's the effect of two heads better than one. So in this paper, what um, the authors did was they designed a task uh, a normal uh, psychophysical task and they ask their observers to do, the, to do the task on their own and then also they combined two people and made dyads and then the dyads then uh, actually gave their joint decision. Okay, So for the same task you have individual decision as well as joint decision and they demonstrated that actually the uh, result from the group decision by the two people actually surpass the individual decision even from the best performer provided that there are some constraints the constraint being that the visual sensibility of the observers has to be matched okay so again there has been many many uh, papers on group decisions in the last 10 years or so especially so my interest in the topic started during one of my project uh, postdoctoral project where we worked on uh, you know, collective uh, wisdom of crowd uh, using a face card discrimination task and uh, the interest in group decision remained. So there has been um, uh, an interesting study recently about the group size. So how do we determine what size is good? And then also from Miguel's lab, there was a very um, a, a recent paper where they actually showed that for different types of tasks the aggregation rule actually um, for one task you may have one aggregation rule that outperforms 
um, the other. So the aggregation rule actually depends on the type of tasks. Okay. So um, this is our main experiment. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the study first. So we, this was a target detection task. So we had 800 images out of which 400 was target present images for 400 target absent images. We had 17 participants and they were not completely naive to the goal of the study. We had a 64 channel AG system where we recorded their neural signals as well as their behaviors, behavior of course, and uh, then we analyzed them. All right, so this is how uh, it looks. So we showed a target cue. So in this case, it is a guitar and then followed by the actual stimulus. And then the job is to look for the target cue uh, guitar in the stimulus quickly because the stimulus is only shown for 50 milliseconds. And then they respond whether the target was present or absent. Okay. So as you can see in this particular image, you have the target which is present on the left side of the image. So when they respond, uh, they not just uh, respond with yes or no. So what we make them do is we make them rate how sure they are that uh, the target was present and how sure, or if in case it's absent, how sure they are that it's absent. So we have their confidence ratings. So we vary the confidence ratings from one to 10, one being absolutely sure that the target is present, five being not so sure the target is present, again, six not so sure the target is present, 10 being absolutely, sorry, six not so sure the target is absent, and 10 being target, you're absolutely sure that the target is absent. So before we go on to the results, so let me talk a little bit about how we process the data. So we have this, what we call uh, the neural pattern classifiers, that's we use, we use machine learning uh, techniques quite a lot in our lab. So uh, given the observers, we have two uh, responses from them. We have the neural signals in terms of EEG, and we also have their behavioral response in terms of confidence ratings. Okay, so the behavioral response is pretty uh, simple to handle uh, compared to the neural signals, which uh, those of you are in a neural signal processing knows it's very not an easy task because the signals are extremely noisy. So it requires a bit of, you know, uh, you need to pre-process and design efficient methods in order to extract the data that you need. So what we typically do is we have this uh, EEG data, which is quite high dimensional, and then we use pattern classifiers, uh, depending on the problem, we use several pattern classifiers, and then we have their neural decision given by these pattern classifiers, and we also have the actual decision given by the behavior, behavior of the subjects, and then we try to correlate between the two and so on. Okay. So, um, again, let me talk a little bit about the two types of aggregation rules that we used for this particular paper. So the first one is the weighted average rule, where the ta for any task i, uh, the decision variable is di is actually given by the uh, linear weight vector w times the ri, which is the response. Okay, so the response in case of behavioral data would be the ratings. In case of neural data would be the neural decision variables, which we get after some uh, processing of the individual decisions okay so this is just a dot product between the uh, ratings um, the response and the weight vector and that gives us the decision okay so what we do is we have the 17 participants then we divide them randomly many times into different group sizes and then we do this cross validation to get a uh, performance accuracy for these different groups Okay, so we estimate this weight vector W from the training data uh, by maximizing what is known as a Fisher's criterion function. Okay, and the, there's a decision criteria C which maximizes the proportion correct, okay, which we also estimate from the training data. So in the weighted average rule, we have a decision criterion C so if your gi is less than equal to c then we 
give the label that it is target present. So your decision is one, which means target present. If the DI, the value is greater than C, then we mark it absent. So it is target absent. So this is the weighted average rule. The majority rule, again, is slightly different. So for behavioral data, we again use a decision criteria, which is different from the weighted average rule for um, majority rule, uh, uh, in the behavior data it's simple so the since we have the ratings that vary from 1 to 10 so our uh, threshold is 5 the midpoint which is 5.5 okay whereas in neural data it's a bit more tricky so what we have to do in the neural data is um, actually uh, we have to find for each participant from their training data we have to estimate and find what is their uh, decision criteria for each individual based on their based on what maximizes the choice probability i'm not going into the details it is there in the paper for anyone interested and then once we have this decision threshold for the neural data for each participant for each task we find out the number of participants that decides on whether the target is present or absent okay so in each case in majority rule we come up with the number that says how many observers in the group marked it present or absent and based on that we decide okay and uh, for simplicity we always keep our group sizes uh, odd so that to avoid ties so again as before so if uh, the majority uh, decides that it's absent then we mark it absent if the majority decides it's present we mark it present so these are the two rules that has been uh, that have been used Okay, now let, let us look at the performance. So here, what we have in the first graph is um, the proportion correct, uh, and we vary the group size. So you can see as we increase the group size, the performance accuracy improves both for behavior and as well as neural data. Okay, and we uh, have shown that there is a very significant correlation between the behavior, uh, the decision variables, uh, both for behavior and neural. And what we see is consistently weighted average rule, actually, although they are very similar, but weighted average rule is slightly better than the majority rule and so statistically significant, okay? And the person correct increases with the increase in group size, okay? so that's all fine but you may argue that we are getting this boost in the performance or the gain in the performance because we are actually using more data we are using data from more electrodes so to control for that we did a separate analysis where what we did was we took um, data from a single brain so 30 electrodes data from a single brain and then we took 59, so almost doubling the electrodes, thus doubling the electrodes, 59 electrodes data from a single brain, okay, just for comparison. And then we took 30 electrodes data from one brain and 30 electrodes data from another brain. So the last one, which says two heads, is actually a combined group decision data, okay. And we showed significantly that the two heads indeed is actually better than one, even with EEG, we can show this and the improvement is not just because we are using more you know data the improvement is because we are using data from different persons okay so this works as a proof of concept that indeed group decision gives us benefit both behaviorally and neurally okay so as i mentioned before uh, there is a strong correlation between uh, the behavior and the neural data but what is interesting is uh, for all our uh, tasks, we actually did a separate study where we um, divided the trials into uh, difficulty levels. Okay, so we have this difficulty levels and we can divide these uh, trials uh, as per the difficulty levels. So what we saw was uh, as we increase the difficulty level, the confidence reduces and which is quite intuitive. So as your task becomes difficult, then the correlation between the behavior and the neural data reduces okay and now the second graph is very interesting so here what we are plotting 
is both for behavior and neural data what we are plotting is the error so the prediction error uh, as we increase the difficulty level on one hand in the x-axis and in the y-axis we are increasing we are varying the group size so what we see is the darker uh, the color so the less is the error the lighter the color color the more is the error so what we see is again as you increase the group size your error reduces as you increase the difficulty level your error increases okay but that's not all what we found out was that you actually need not use all the members of the data uh, so you did not use the maximum group size to actually get a performance boost okay so this is an interesting finding where we showed that the optimum group size is not necessarily the maximum group size so you can get the same level of performance boost using lesser number of um, uh, individuals in when you are combining in a group so what we found out was instead of using 17 observers which is the total number of observers that we have we can actually achieve similar performance both behaviorally and neurally if we just combine 13 observers or 15 observers so 13 is the least uh, the optimum size that we got okay all right so uh, next what we wanted to see uh, was um, how uh, the how we wanted to see what is the actual benefit we wanted to quantify the benefits of group decision so we computed the person benefit as group prediction error minus your individual prediction error divided by the individual prediction error so that gives you your percentage benefit for group decision and we saw that intuitively it again reduces as the tasks become difficult and this is consistent both in behavior and in neural data okay we also did an erp analysis the uh, where we found that um, around um, post 300 milliseconds this after the stimulus was shown you have uh, you see more more activity mainly in the parietal regions okay so the parietal region seems to be active um, 300 milliseconds post uh, stimulus onset and on the right is the erp for the target present and absent okay now we also wanted to look at the intersubject correlation as a function of task difficulty in both behavior and neural data so this intersubject correlation or group i'm um, sorry or isc has been shown to be a marker of engagement uh, memory and development in previous studies we wanted to see whether it actually has any relation with um, uh, group decision as we increase the difficulty level and what we found was that the group isc indeed have uh, relations again the correlation uh, decreased as the difficulty level increased both neurally and behaviorally very consistent results but what was also very interesting is now what we can do in eeg is because it has a very uh, good temporal resolution we break the eeg signals into small time windows of 40 milliseconds and what we found out that uh, about 200 to 240 milliseconds post um the uh, stimulus onset you see the maximum group isc so the maximum correlation occurs around 200 to 240 milliseconds after which the correlation decreases the amplitude of the correlation is dependent on the difficulty level but the latency remains the same so it maximizes around 200 to 240 milliseconds which was interesting because on the right we have again the same plot but now this time we are plotting the percentage correct instead of group isc what we see is after the group isc reduces we actually start seeing the neural benefits the gain in the performance okay so it almost looks like the group isc can be a potential marker for your neural benefit and uh, also uh, we think that the group isc is similar so the correlation between uh, observers are similar when at a sensory stage so in the early processing 
whereas they start to differ so the correlations also differ as you move on to the more decision stage and you see the neural benefit more post in the later stages so in the decision making stage but the correlation uh, sort of this group IEC sort of gives you a marker so it precedes the neural benefits okay so I think um, I will uh, stop here now but before I stop so just the take-home points for the uh, work I presented so far so what we showed was that if we pull neural information across multiple brains uh, we showed that for visual search type of tasks weighted average uh, accomplishes unique advantage compared to the uh, majority rule and the error in the neural performance and behavioral performance increase with task difficulty and the optimum group size does not necessarily imply the maximum group size when we consider the improvement in performance and the inter subject correlation of the groups decreased as your decision accuracy increases okay so these are the four uh, sort of salient points and um this is uh, i'll just end with uh, my you know lab a uh, little bit talk about a little bit uh, of what we do in our lab at icer kolkata so we have um a 64 channel uh, EEG system working. We actually have two uh, because we planned to do an actual group decision where we have, you know, groups of two or three observers doing the task. Unfortunately, uh, for the last year, uh, almost nothing could be done. So uh, yeah, hopefully when we were actually planning to restart uh, the experiments, uh, then again, the second wave hit. So. It's kind of in a limbo currently, but we generally work with a lot of mostly natural scenes or face car type of tasks like object recognition, visual search, visual perception in general. And we use a lot of computational techniques, modeling, machine learning, data analysis. And recently we have started working on food, how we perceive food. And this is a very you know, introductory state, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Uh, we, I also worked on autism spectral disorder. We uh, designed a new method based on topology, which, which can be used for detecting the autistic um, kids from the non-autistic kids. OK, so I'll stop here. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take it. Wonderful. That was super fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Das. Um, uh, I'll just start off by saying, so many of our speakers say, oh, I'm not a biologist, oh, I'm a fake biologist. But honestly, for me, it just showcases how diverse neuroscience is and how many different people are interested in the brain. And that's always a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you definitely for your time and, and for being here with us. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. So if you don't mind, I'm going to dive right in. Um, this is from Arushi Batra, and she asks, do the same principles apply in collective behavior seen in birds and others? Um, do we expect groups to sustain, efficiently sustain, I guess, the external perturbations and environment changes? And if yes, this means, for example, let's say when a predator attacks uh, a bird, not only must the information be propagated fast, but also the group should be cohesive and that cohesion, cohesion should be retained. Um, does the density change or do they disaggregate or form like break into separate groups? Um, how does that change things? Um, I am not sure about the bird literature, uh, but I, there has been a lot of work with honeybees and mm. how they waggle the waggle dance. So there has been a lot of work with um, Sorkin slap. Um, where they have studied um, the honeybees and their collective behavior uh, quite a bit. I am not, I don't recollect um, any uh, literature from the birth about collective behavior. Um, and also, I mean, we don't know what rules they use to aggregate, actually. So for honeybees, we have some sort of idea uh, from the waggles and they generally um, reach a quorum. So the way they reach a quorum is different, but once you reach a quorum and then, you know, the decision, that is your decision threshold. So from there, you, the decision is made. So how you reach a quorum varies from species to species. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. 
Um, I have a question, actually. Uh, since we've been listening to so many different talks today, uh, your talk reminded me of Sharika's talk in the beginning. And so it got me thinking, um, if you have you thought about whether if you have conspecifics or in-group members as part of a group uh, versus, I don't know, say, non-conspecifics, right? The people, uh, I guess in, in your case, it will be people who look different or for example, people of different genders or people from different races. And if you put them in a group and you aggregate them into one group, do you think the efficiency of decision-making will be, will be changed or will it be affected? Uh, it's a good question. I think they should have an effect. There are a lot of behavioral studies not taking um, the diversity specifically, uh, but there are a lot of behavioral studies where if you um, if you are given decisions by your peers rather than by your colleagues, you tend to kind of you know pay attention more. So we had uh, uh, one previous work where we showed uh, the decisions of previous people who performed the task well, and uh, that. Uh, had an effect so actually these were we just manipulated there were no decisions by the well performers but we just told them that it was and that actually we were able to manipulate uh, their decisions based on uh, when we said that you know the, here are the decisions of you know well performing to well performing individuals and then their own um, sort of threshold shift shift not everyone so we have some people who are very strong on their decisions and they don't waver but uh, there are some people uh, who sort of are more malleable so to speak and then yeah no i think we know that just from anecdotal data right just just how people right, right. yeah so, um yeah the questions are coming in fast so i'm gonna i'm gonna quickly try to ask them for you sure. um, there's a question from keithi saluja who says great talk dr das just a quick question on what were the different difficulty levels in this experiment Oh, okay. So what we did was we did a separate study where we showed a different bunch of subjects, um, just the images and uh, the targets and told them, uh, do you think that it is very easy to find the target or do you think it's difficult to find the target? So they, a separate group of study sort of gave, you know, how confident they are that this is an easy task or how confident they are that this is a difficult task. So based on that, we divided the images that we shown here as you know easy or difficult. So yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Crowdsource. I mean, you are showing it to a group of people, so you might as well crowdsource the difficulty. That right. that makes sense definitely. Um, from an anonymous attendee, wonderful talk. Uh, very basic, but in the beginning, it was said that two people performed better provided their visual sense matched. Oh, so visual sensitive sensibility, sorry. Um, so the visual sensibility match. So there's a very like standard technique a way in visual um, science, visual perception to measure your visual sensibility. So you can plot your psychometric curve for each individual so that we know the baseline. Essentially, the uh, essence is so that the baseline for the two uh, are sort of matched. For example, just to put it in a very crude way, so if we have groups where one is a very good performer and where, where one is very bad, right? So then the information gain that you get from that group might not be that, you know, great. Yeah. Where, whereas the information gain that you gain from two sort of okay performers would probably be better. That's what they showed in their data. That as it's long as the interesting though, like the the difference in abilities you would think should translate into sort of like a better, generally a better improvement in performance. But so in that fact, also happens. But for what they showed, because there was just two groups, two two. This was a study with dyads. So there they saw that if you have very like there the sensibility kind of makes you that has an effect on what is it that you're perceiving, right? If I have a very different sensibility, so they showed this kind of this game or patches. So I might see this, I might not be able to see this at all. Whereas a person who has a very good sensibility will uh, see it very quickly. So right. they're in right. the difference, the way they perceive the stimulus would be very different. So they want to match the stimulus. 
I guess the level that you're the stage. Yeah. 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 No, that that makes sense. Thank you. This was fantastic. Um, do we have time for one more question? I probably well I, I encourage you to please use the QA box. Uh, there are some coming in. But yeah, feel free to type the answers um, as you see fit. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Das. Uh, it was a pleasure having you with us. Um, and we are all done with our speakers for the day. Um, and uh, we come to the end of our invited speaker talks. And I hope to now transition to giving my closing address. Um, let's see. I'm going to fill up some slides and get ready for it. So give me just a moment. Excellent. Um, let's see. Sweet. And that should do it. Now I'm going to ask the question that everybody asks. Can you see my screen as, and can you see my first slide? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vaishnavi. I, I, I will quickly start going through these. So thank you, everybody, whoever is present here today, whoever is watching uh, on YouTube. It's been, it's been a wild ride, <laughs> a wild being, uh, you know, a very mild word at this point. Um, thanks to everybody, like really all the speakers are coming in and, and I'm going to try to, to see if I can sum this up you know, properly with, with with sort of good words to say uh, at the end of these, all of these five days. So it's a very enviable job, I know, uh, you know, to be able to have the last word in a, in a conference like this, but it's been undeniably amazing. And like, I, I, I'm sure everybody else would have their own choice of adjectives. Um, happy to hear all of them, but thanks for being here. I think that's, that's pretty much going to be the gist of what I want to say today. Um, Sweet. So all of this started <laughs> because of the Neurofarm India database. I have zero problems in admitting that um, I made this database because I was angry. Uh, I was mad uh, that not enough people, uh, not enough women were included in, in talks. Uh, not enough Indian neuroscientists were, in, were included in, Indian women neuroscientists were included in talks and panels and seminars. Um, we made this database. Uh, as you can see the date, it was very long ago before our world as we know it changed. It was back in December, 2019. Um, we try to keep it updated as much as possible, uh, but it's primarily, it's a curated collection of information. It's primarily women neuroscientists were faculty members at research institutes across India. Um, when we started building this, I honestly had no idea how many women, Indian women neuroscientists I would find. Um, in my head, I, I have, again, no shame in admitting, in my head, I thought, oh, maybe if we find like 30, it's it's a good thing. Uh, but I was blown out of the water. I have never been this happy to admit how wrong I was. We found 130 women um, and, well, women and other genders. So needless to say, we're, we're more than happy to expand the scope uh, of this database to try and include as many underrepresented genders as we can. Uh, this is my promise to Bitu, and I hope everybody holds me to it. Um, as I said, one of the biggest motivations to organize this conference really uh, is to for me to see uh, for and for me to show everybody how amazing like the ecosystem is and how, what amazing speakers we have and amazing scientists we have uh, in Indian neuroscience. And the fact that these just happen to be women it should not be a reason to exclude them from the narrative, should not be a reason to exclude them from the mainstream. Um, and I, and I, the one of the biggest excuses that we always get, and now as part of Vice Watch India, but in general, uh, we always get is that, oh, there simply aren't enough women. You know, there simply aren't enough women in the field. We can't really invite them as speakers. Uh, there are not enough women of stature. There are not enough women who are senior. Um, and, and I hope 
at the end of, of all of this, of five days of these excellent talks, um, and, and after looking at the database, um, I, I hope people realize the futility of using that excuse again. And, and it is a dream. I really hope I never get to hear that again, but you know, it takes time for the world to change. And I'm, I'm happy to wait to see what people think. Um, so to give you a small glimpse, you know, as, as scientists, as people who work with data all the time, it would be <laughs> it would be a miss if I don't talk about, you know, what kind of data and, and insights we got from our conference. So uh, this is done entirely by Abhilasha, by the way. Let me just pull up her her photo. Um, Abhilasha Joshi is is one of our core members, and she's been amazing. She she did all of this in such little time. But basically, she looked at who registered for Neurofarm India 2021. Um, I am very happy to see that there's been a hugely sort of diverse population. It isn't just bachelor students. We've got uh, bachelor students, master students, postdocs, faculty, PhD students, and so many people of the general public. As a science communicator, it is so heartwarming to see that people are interested uh, in, in coming and listening to what we have to say. Um, what was <laughs> disappointing to begin with was uh, the gender distribution of our registrations. It's a little sad to see that only women will turn up in droves to support women, but it is a good start. Um, all said and done, I would rather have this than, you know, very few people show up. Although I must say, I, again, I did not expect 477 <laughs> registrations, but we did have it. We hit, we're hit. we almost hitting the ceiling of, of what is possible uh, on our Zoom account, which is 500 registrants. So to everybody, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you for registering. And I hope you got something out of all of these talks. Um, and this is something that, again, Abhilash has been amazing, but uh, surprising or maybe not so surprising for us, I guess, uh, in the core group, it, it wasn't very surprising. I mean, to see that um, women turn up, again, in, in droves to support other women. So across, across sort of, you know, career paths, across, even across like gender public and, and press and journalist media, 70, more than 70 percent have all been, have all identified as, as women and female. Um, and so I guess saying that I'm a little disappointed that a lot of men don't want to attend this or didn't want to attend it or didn't want to register for it, we don't know. Um, yeah, it's a little disappointing. But uh, the fact that we're, we're going to put everything up on YouTube, on our BioSearch in their YouTube channel, and it's the time of you know, pandemic where work life schedules are completely out the window. We're really hoping we get sort of more viewers who are who are men who identify, especially as cis men in the Indian neuroscientist ecosystem to come and, and watch all of these amazing talks, uh, not to mention like the, the special sessions we had, which are insightful in more ways than one. But I really hope we we get to sort of see our message and, and the science percolate through uh, Indian neuroscience. Um, just a quick uh, summary of what we see on the back end. Um, we had, so these are our daily views, I guess, uh, for the last four days, clearly we couldn't get one for today, but the last four days, as I said, um, asynchronous views dominate, which makes perfect sense. I mean, not everybody has the time. It's a weekday. We sort of tried to straddle it over the weekday and the weekend, hoping we would get uh, more viewers one way or another. But as you can see, more people tend to actually go back to our uh, channel and watch the streams later on YouTube. And for that, we're very thankful. And I'm, and I'm glad we were able to do this. And I'm glad we were able to get the sort of tech and the background uh, set up to do this. Um, and oh, I'm going to go back there. Uh, the, the, these are the two special sessions. Um, Again, I have no words. The bias panel literally blew us out of the water. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, I always, I've been trying to tell people in the core organizing committee, like you, you try to get people together and you sort of cross your fingers and you hope something good happens and something nice happens. But this was, this is clearly a, a, a reaction that I, 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 
I don't have words for it. It's, it's, it was amazing. The panel, the video of the panel was shared so often on Twitter and clearly the evidence is here on YouTube as you can see so many people saw it. We were kind of hoping you would give a little more love to the Ungendered Workshop also, but that's fine. You know, people should feel free to sort of look through and see what workshop is best, works best for them, what works best for their institute, what works best for their community. Um, and I hope just by having a workshop in this conference, we are able to give you that confidence boost so that you can go ahead in your community and say, hey, let's have something like this because this is sorely needed. Um, so what's next? Um, as part of Vice Watch India, we're funded by uh, Vaishnavi's Embo's Young Investigator Grant. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to sort of sort of slowly siphon off bits of those uh, bits of those money uh, to develop our database. Uh, we have a database of women, Indian women scientists, because currently there is no publicly accessible repository of data on Indian women scientists. Who is a scientist? What is their name? What is their faculty position? Where do they work? Um, how have they moved across in their career? Um, and no, RTIs are not the answer. I know I always get this as a reply when I when I ask people for something like this. It is tiring, not to mention way too much work to sort of file RTIs, single, single RTIs to answer each of these questions. Uh, so we really are looking to use whatever little money we have to sort of really goal direct it and, and try to develop this, this database as much as possible. We also want to, um, and we're going to do this basically by offering internships uh, via BioSearch India. Um, they're basically, you know, we try to get two interns every three months. It's it's really hard work. I don't know if uh, people have been checking out our BioSearch India website, but it is very hard work because none of this data is, um, it's not something you can simply write a code and say, oh, I'm going to scrap the whole of the internet, or, sorry, scrape the whole of the internet to, you know, sort of just get numbers from each of these institute websites, because each website is different. You need a human to go in there, go to the website, go to their faculty list, take everything down and like mark out the women and say, what are they doing? Who are they? What is their uh, affiliation and so on? And so this is hard work and we try not to sort of overload our interns, but we try to get two of them every three months. Um, this helps us really constantly fine tune sort of these field specific base rates. And this is important because we need to know what is the prevalent base rate. I mean, uh, again, the, the, one of the ma major questions I kept keep getting back, uh, one of the major answers that I keep getting back is, oh, there aren't enough women in the field. But really, who knows how many women in the field there are? And literally, this base rate is going to give us that answer. If there are fewer women in a, in a field, why are there few women in a field? And all of these sort of pieces of data are so important when you're trying to consider policies, when you're trying to consider sort of the big picture view of, of how to direct science in a country, in a nation, um, especially for India, because we are so diverse um, and, and having data is so powerful, uh, especially this kind of data and in trying to decide what our next steps should be. Um, what's next part two? We also offer com conference supplements. So this is something we've done once, uh, twice, I think already. Uh, Amatya will be very happy to, to note. Amatya is one of our core volunteers. He was actually part of Project Encephalon and they were one of the beneficiaries of this conference supplement. So basically what it is, we hope <laughs> for at least 30 to 50% gender parity in a speaker list in any conference held in India on any platform. It can be virtual, it can be in-person. Uh, I don't know how, how much more time it's going to take to get to in-person conferences, but anything, um, a seminar, a speaker set, a, a conference, whatever whatever you're organizing. Um, if you at least manage to hit 30 to 50%, uh, we will give you money. We will give you a supplement uh, and hope it, it goes to a sort of conference organization. We hope it helps. Um, I know we've had some, some mixed reactions about this saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't be giving you shouldn't be rewarding people with money simply to like do something that's so obvious, which is include women. Um, but the sad part is, um, <laughs> it, it, it sounds cheap, but the sad part is uh, th there are very few actual, you know, incentives that you can put on the table. That's that's physical incentive to say, hi, if you do this, you will get the other thing. And it's a good thing. I and mean, money is always a good incentive um, and we hope we don't have to keep continuing with this you know I mean it's, it's it's not something that we want to do forever but we do want to do it long enough to make sure that people realize that 
it should come from within. You should be able to do this without getting an incentive. You should be able to do this as a conference organizer without somebody coming to your back, somebody coming to you and saying, patting you on your back and saying, oh, good job. You actually found enough women uh, for this session. So it, all good behaviors need a nudge. And, and I sincerely believe this is our nudge towards, towards that goal. Um, Lots of people have asked me, uh, what can you do <laughs> when you're a science in India? Not just me, I'm not alone. It's a huge community. Um, use the database, please. It's, it's free, it's accessible. Uh, we've been sharing the links for it all over. Uh, please use the database. Uh, it was so nice to hear uh, some of the speakers and some of the field leaders actually tell us that, oh, they use it to find other speakers or find other collaborators. Um, and that's exactly how we want it to be used. Um, we, we have no issues. We don't we don't even need, we don't even need to uh, be accredited or cited. It's, it's it's a public it's public data, and all we've managed to do is just pull things together. Um, invite speakers from under underrepresented genders for your next talk or seminar or workshop. Um, it 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 does not take a lot of effort. Uh, it it you literally have to see an uh, an announcement and be like, there aren't enough women here. That's all you need to say. And sometimes that can get the ball rolling. That can start a cascade reaction to say, okay, maybe we're not doing enough in terms of inclusion, and maybe we're not do doing enough in terms of having enough voices at the table. Um, Many, many people have also asked us about the next conference and, and I'm very happy personally, and we're all very happy that they did. But you know, organizing an event like this is very hard work. Um, and we're all full-time scientists. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral scientist. Every single person on the core organizing committee um, is an early career uh, fellow, is an early career researcher. It's not easy. Um, as Dr. Vasta showed us today so beautifully and so elegantly, there are so many demands on your time, not to mention your personal life and you know how things are happening on that front. Um, so try <laughs> in the spirit of creating community, we really hope some of our speakers and people who attended uh, this week uh, to come forward and, and really contribute to organizing this this next time or the next iteration. Um, it, it is my honor, it's my privilege to have started this, but um, I would also like to do science. I want to be part of this community, so I'm really hoping somebody steps forward uh, to take up the mantle. Uh, what can you do for science in India? You know, neuroscience is niche, neuroscience is small. We were able to you know, wing through all of this because it's a very small community. And it's very tight knit, as you can see. But what can you do for, for, for science? You know, use the base rate maps. We have a bunch of maps that actually Abhishek has taken a lot of time and effort to make. Um, it's a very beautiful way to look at all the data that we've collected. It gives you at a glance a really good idea of how many women are there in which part of the country, in which institute. Uh, you know the name of the, you can find out the name of the institute right there on the map. You can go to their website see who is there in that institute and invite them. I mean, it's it's very easy to sort of go and figure out um, if they're a good fit for your seminar, for your talk series and so on. Um, just go to their website. Again, invite more speakers from underrepresented genders for your next talk, seminar or workshop. And with that, I will start thanking people. I hope people are still hanging around. Um, if you are, thank you for staying, first of all. Um, thank you to Alba. Alba Network is fantastic. They've, been, they've worked with us so well. Uh, they've taken an active role. They've, they've, they very clearly said, we don't want to be the ones just giving money. We really want to be there at the table. We want to help you make decisions and we want to help be part of this process. And for that, we are very thankful. Um, and they've been very patient with all the logistics and all the things that worked, didn't work uh, uh, in the middle. And they've been such a great source of support. Um, all our bias panel speakers. I, like I said, I have no words. Um, it was a beautiful session, two and a half hours. I didn't know how it passed. I think, I hope I, I approximate our feelings when I say we all sat there with like a lump in our throats because we, because so many of the things that we think about or we thought about or we've gone through, somebody came on a screen and said it. Um, and there is there is power in that, and there's power in in listening to that, um, and that's what creates like solidarity, and that's what creates community. And um, definitely thankful for for Professor Tole, for Shubha for coming in, for for being 
for being a listener right um sometimes you it feels like you're you're wailing away in, in your corner of academia and nobody's listening to you but to have somebody in a position of power as a full professor in a big institute to have shubha come and say i'm here tell me about it um and i think that was that was excellent and i'm so glad she she did that and she took time out to do that um ungender for being so flexible uh, they uh, pallavi is the head of ungender they usually don't do anything related to academia as you can see i had a we had a really tough time trying to find somebody who would you know um tailor a workshop for indian academia for bias in indian academia it simply doesn't exist in fact it doesn't even exist that uh, there aren't even that many people who do it for corporate india and ungender actually does that they do sort of uh, sexual harassment awareness classes um they help you understand the laws they help you understand um sort of how to file sexual harassment cases all of this for corporate world um so i'm i'm very thankful for pallavi to even sort of try to approximate it and try to modify it uh for indian academia uh, and i hope more, more sort of indian conferences think about this uh, and and sort of try in their own way to have some sort of you know a, a workshop on bias sensitization uh, and gender sensitization um our field leaders um our, our main speakers they've been so wonderful each one of them has given like a beautiful insight into what the field is how the field evolved in india um the kind of people who were in there and i'm so thankful so many of them highlighted so many women scientists veronica especially um and i'm i'm really glad that we that they managed to make time that they managed to come and and give us sort of this insight all our speakers i can't name them one by one but every single one of them said yes and they said they will make time for it and they will try their best to come so many of them sent backup videos in case you know their their internet is bad or something breaks down and we're very very thankful uh, that they managed to do this and they managed to be here with us maybe it wasn't a lot of time it was a couple of hours over five days every day but i'm just happy they said yes and i'm just happy we got to listen to them our core group uh, that has been a sounding board for so many decisions that we've made um avilasha is from ucsf anupama from iisc bhavna from instem uh, nivedita from nvrc poonam from icer tirunandapuram shilogna from albert einstein college and sushmita from iit jodhpur we've as you can see we're a very diverse group um i tried to sort of have enough people from the diaspora so that we can <laughs> pick diaspora speakers we i'm we're so lucky we managed to get uh, the people who said yes and and we got to listen to them um and we tried to really scan across the country because you know bangalore is always known to be like the focus point for everything biology but there is so much neuroscience going on in so many other places and i'm um, i'm just happy again thank you for all your time and effort and and all the zoom calls and and all the hard work that you put in um and for making this event a success for coming and and helping out um avilasha specifically cuz she's uh, this she took on all by herself and i just have to have a special mention for her um this is her idea and her baby all the way through uh, we actually got information from our speakers and we're going to try to use that to make uh, wikipedia pages wikipedia in general has a problem with women representation and women scientists representation um and abhilasha and i and and a lot of us firmly believe that it's time we started putting women notable women in neuroscience indian women in neuroscience on wikipedia and and this as you can see is an example it's a draft um example for dr nandini chatterjee singh who actually spoke today um and this work she's doing with uh, asmita sarkar with saumya geeta with subramanya hekde um and deepthi mahishi and she's been fantastic in coordinating everything trying to figure out we were just having a chat yesterday about like copyrights and and how to get like a good image um how to sort of edit um and she's really been very on the forefront of you know learning the ins and outs of how writing for wikipedia works so thank you abhilasha really for all the time and effort our event volunteers have been like super men and super women and and super people i am so happy they've every time we've had some trouble they've had no problem filling in uh most of the things happen as you can see in the back end it happens so fast and so quickly and they are so responsive um and i'm so happy to have worked with them uh, these last 5 days um and they've been excellent i mean i can't wait 
to see what they end up doing uh, in their careers. But I know it's going to be fantastic, whatever they end up doing. Um, Amartya is from PIFR, Annapurna from CCMB, Arushi from IGIB, and Tasneem, who's an alumnus of ISA Pune. Um, comms volunteers. I'm going to take like a little bit of time here because um, our star is Sahana. Sahana Gangadharan from IIT Madras has been a backbone, <laughs> literally. So a lot of, we've had so many speakers and sort of managing to collate information across CVs, across abstracts, across bios uh, is, is a gargantuan task, right? Because you 25 speakers, 30 speakers, we're all going to come and talk. Um, her work was basically collating all of this information from multiple sources and writing all the cheat sheets. So basically all the sheets that we use to introduce speakers every day, um, all, the, all the information that the field leaders use to introduce uh, the speakers that come after them, all of this is Sahana's work. Um, and she even formatted the talk abstract document, she edited, she annotated, um, and she's going to help us transcribe <laughs> this entire conference, the every single live stream link. Um, and, and hopefully annotate it and subtitle it so we can put it up in a cleaned up version so that even disabled people will be able to sort of watch the videos and understand what's going on. Um, and so she's she's been a real trooper and, and thank you Sahana so much. Uh, she's one of the students, I, I know the PIs will know what I say. She's one of the students who you give her some work, she's gonna finish it and then she's gonna, she's gonna finish it in like two seconds and she's gonna come back and say, hi, is there anything else for me? And that's a rare quality, and I think that should be really cherished. Um, Rubina has been a trooper, really. Rubina is not in neuroscience. She doesn't have a neuroscience background. But all the tweets that you'll see go, seen go out from Neurofarm India uh, for the last month, um, the cards, the photos, the information collating, um, writing the tweets, uh, she's, she's the face behind it all. Uh, and I'm so happy I got to work with her. I actually ended up... Um, we, we actually ended up meeting uh, in the Life of Science calendar event, and I was so happy that we managed to connect. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really glad that, uh, and I hope she had a good time, but I'm really glad she decided to help us uh, for the last month or so. And finally, Avishay Chari, uh, who has basically handled all the communication for this event. So again, writing all the documents, putting together all the cheat sheets, uh, keeping everybody updated so much text, like so much, so much text. Uh, one of my friends used to say, there is such a thing as text-induced depression. And yes, it happens. I mean, you know, you know, when you've written multiple papers, you know it happens. Um, but Abhishek has been a soldier, really. Um, picking up all the times where I dropped the ball, uh, correcting all the mistakes that I've made. Um, and he's been sort of a wonderful comms manager. Um, and I'm with him uh, as part of Agencycom. And I'm so proud to say that I was able to, we were able to do this for Vice Watch India. It was really an, an, an honor and a privilege. Um, and this won't end, of course, without me thanking Vaishnavi. Um, she is, I, I, I think um, ever since I met her, I think I realized what peer mentoring means. And, and I say this to everybody uh, with true feeling, find a peer find a peer who can talk to you. Horizontal mentoring is so undervalued, especially for women. And Vaishnavi has been that person for me through, uh, through this last year. I can't believe we've only known each other for a year. I feel like I've known her for so long. Um, she's been amazing. Amazing is like an understatement, but she's been just simply amazing. And I don't know how, sometimes when things click, they just click and we've managed to work across time differences. Uh, I've, I've been here, Vaishnavi was in India, we still managed to get it to work. We started by Search India. Vaishnavi finished in India, moved to Australia. We still managed to get it work uh, because even if the time difference is punishing, really, um, but things work and, and we, our working styles match so well. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't have asked for a better partner. Thank you for all your time. And, <laughs> I just wanted to put this up because I wanted to tell people how important it is to put your ideas out there. I, I, I'm, I know people will balk at me when I say this, but I'm actually not a super user on Twitter. Like I know many, many more people who use Twitter much more efficiently and much more nicely. But this is an example of how just one tweet makes all the difference. And this is the tweet where I was, you know, watching, I was looking at some posters from Indian Academia and I saw 
you know, how do we do this? Like, is there a way to make bias watch for India? And well, you have seen the outcome of it all. As you can see, Vaishnavi was there. She was literally there one day later saying, yes, most definitely worth it. We can collate data. Let's start doing this. Um, and as you can see, the rest is history. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to, to give us feedback. Uh, we are at Bias Watch India on Twitter. Our email is, is always there, biaswatchindia at gmail.com. Uh, we will still keep the event handle going for a while because I feel like it's a great sort of nexus for anybody who is in Indian neuroscience on Twitter, uh, especially women. Uh, feel free to tweet at us. Feel free to include us in conversations. We're more than happy to be uh, to give feedback and to be included in in everything that's going on in the Indian neuroscience ecosystem. I am supposed to put Aisha yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I my my hands are off the mouse. Yeah, you have to go to the next slide. Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> that's the only thing. Yeah, that's the only thing you need to do. Um, Yes, so I think first before I thank Shruti, I do have to thank Abhishek as well. Uh, he has uh, shown us such phenomenal support behind the scenes to make this conference such a success. Many, many thanks, Abhishek. Um, of course, we cannot end this conference without thanking the person that has poured her sweat and blood into this event, Shruti Morlider. <laughs> I am really thankful that I got in touch with her after her first tweet that you just saw. And uh, we are now partners in crime, as she mentioned. Um, in addition to seeding the idea for Bias Watch India, she's of course created the Neurofarm India list and has super enthusiastically worked day and night to make this happen. Um, in fact, as you can, uh, you can tell, she's probably, uh, she's been waking up at 3 a.m. every day to just sit through the meeting, to not just sit through the meeting, but to actively participate. Um, in fact, uh, when they invited speakers, keep saying they thank Shruti and Vaishnavi. It's a little grating for me to hear because I played a super tiny role in the organizing of this conference. Um, so Bias Watch India and Eurofarm India really owe our existence to her. And I'm super grateful to know Shruti and call her my friend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vaishnavi. Ah, uh, breakout rooms. <laughs> there should be a link <laughs> coming <forget>. up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a link coming up on your on your chat box soon. We tried this yesterday. And we hope it works today too. But basically, uh, click on the link, go to the breakout room. Hopefully, our speakers will join us there, um, and hopefully, the attendees get to ask questions, discuss work, um, and continue this conversation in a smaller setting. So, um, thanks everybody, and have a wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you are.